All right, then. Uh, uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome back to the third day of this uh, uh, webinar on uh, serpentinizing science. Uh, I'm going to give just a quick recap or overview of, of yesterday's uh, uh, session and then kick it over to Steve Vance, who will be uh, your host for the rest of the morning or afternoon or evening, depending on your time zone. Anyway, I just wanted to... to highlight a couple of lessons or things that seem to pop out to me as to what we learned from yesterday's session. Uh, and I've listed those here in this slide. And, and so one of the things that I think uh, that is of particular relevance to astrobiology is, is the uh, uh, production of hydrogen during serpentinization. And I think we saw reflected in yesterday's talk that uh, kind of the rates of hydrogen generation are highly variable under different conditions and in different environments. And uh, but it's not really clear yet as what is underlying those variations and, and understanding why those uh, variations occur and how it might translate into how much hydrogen might be supplied in different kinds of environments is something that really needs a lot more work to go on in, in, as we go forward. Uh, very uh, intimately key linked into that is the uh, distribution of iron among the products, which really controls the hydrogen production. Thank you. And uh, I think we've seen uh, yesterday in, in a couple mm -hmm. of talks that there really is a lot of heterogeneity in where that iron goes in the reaction products and and, and uh, how that gets reflected in the hydrogen production. And again, that's an area where I think we really need to uh, have a lot more work to see, uh, to really look in samples and natural samples and see where it's going and do more uh, modeling and theoretical work and experimental work to really understand what's controlling where that iron is going. Uh, we saw yesterday from uh, Sanjoy and, and the previous day from Everett Schock uh, that we're seeing that models are really uh, progressing in order in, and uh, just helping us understand the, our ability to map out uh, where energy sources occur in these kinds of environments and what conditions uh, make it more favorable and less favorable to support life. Uh, and I think going forward, it's going to be interesting to see how well those pr predictions uh, compare with observations in the natural systems and, and try and link those two together and see if we can come to uh, a, a clearer understanding of where different microbes occur and, and why. And then lastly, we saw a, a presentation from Mike Russell and and uh, as we saw, these, these, you know, the theories for possible origins of life and kind of serpentinizing environment are continuing to evolve as we begin to know more about the systems and learn more about the chemistry and that it goes on in those systems. And uh, uh, a lot of this stuff is still really very much hypothetical and needs to be tested experimentally. So I'm looking forward to more developments in terms of experimentally testing some of the ideas that Mike and others have proposed in terms of what might have led to origins of life on Earth in serpentinizing systems and what might be uh, take place somewhere else in our solar system where we see serpentinizing systems and whether that could have led to an or another origin of life. And lastly, I just wanted to comment that you know we didn't really have time to even get into the abiotic carbon source story. Uh, so a lot of people are interested in the potential for uh, serpentinizing, serpentinizing systems to make methane, make abiotic methane, uh, both as a source for, for uh, microbial metabolism and also as a potential signature for looking to see if we can determine whether life exists on other planets. Uh, but uh, that's, a, that's an area that's really a, a lot of ongoing research in that, something that we didn't really you can get to touch on yesterday, but we uh, we need to keep in mind. Well, and that's pretty much all I had to say. So uh, I'm going to kick it over to uh, Steve Vance for uh, today's session. All right, Tom. Thanks so much. Yeah, it's been an exciting couple of days. I've certainly learned a lot, and. Uh, it's nice to see what everyone is up to. Uh, today's session is about planetary serpentinizat. Um, I'm sorry, it seems that the uh, widescreen slide is a little bit cut off. I think for most of my other slides, this will not be uh, too much of a problem. 
I'll just say what I have to say and let the other speakers take over. Um, so planetary serpentinization, as you know, thinking about serpentinization in the planetary context uh, encourages us also to think about the Earth planetary context of serpentinization. Um, so what we observe on Earth comes about by virtue of um, um, the configuration of Earth continents uh, and the relation of Earth's um, surface layer to its deeper interior uh, and also to its exterior. Uh, similarly, other worlds uh, will have a, a similar set of conditions that influence what we observe. And how do I advance my slide? Like that. Um, okay, so the Earth system, again, we are this uh, little soup skin on top of the, the mantle with the, the crust underneath. Uh, our ocean uh, and the continents uh, interact um, with, um, well, the fluids uh, interact with um, the underlying rock um, to constrained depth. Um, and the composition of those rocks determines the materials that come out. Um, so um, similarly, planet, understanding planetary serpentinization will be about understanding other system uh, contexts and how that relates to habitability. We want to understand um, what we might be able to observe with upcoming missions. Here's the Europa a multiple flyby mission that's planned to arrive at Europa in 2026. And we'll have a suite of instruments um, to look at the surface and try to understand the composition of the ocean. Uh, these are those instruments, but um, there's a capable suite of remote sensing instruments to understand the surface composition and geology. Um, and, um, and a set of in-situ instruments here shown in red that includes two mass spectrometers um, that could um, taste the ocean um, if there are materials that are lofted from, the, from, the, from within the ice via um, yet to be confirmed plumes. Um, so there's some hope that we will be able to infer something about serpentinization. What I'd really like to see from some of the experts uh, who've been attending this meeting is um, some weighing in about uh, the detailed signatures, for example, isotopic signatures or mineral signatures that we should really look for. Um, some uh, hints of the ocean composition. Um, a similar story applies at um, other worlds like Enceladus, which we'll hear about later. Um, and the upcoming Mars 2020 rover also has a capable set of instruments, including uh, um, we heard about some advanced uh, techniques uh, yesterday, uh, including the application of Raman to understanding the detailed um, mineral progression um, that can tell us something about the, the history of serpentinization. System context, let me just say a few things about um, Europa as an example of the kinds of things that we want to understand in terms of the habitability context of serpentinization. So, well, let me by, to to get at that. Let me let me just emphasize that the Earth system is complex. There are a lot of different reservoirs that interact with each other to show Earth habitable. And um, the context of serpentinization, then, as illustrated in this uh, figure from a paper by Sherwood Lawler, is about understanding um, what's the flux. So, what is the um, amount of material that's generated? And how does that couple into the global biosphere? Ask that for a lot of different reservoirs. Um, you know, so these are the these are the um, reservoirs that were examined in this paper: the um, alteration of the oceanic crust, spreading ridges, um, and um, per peridotites. Um, so we can ask what are the what are the what are the reservoirs on other worlds? And I want to emphasize that these reservoirs. Um, can change with time. Earth's history is complex. Um, this, this, this group probably understands this, and many of you better than I do. The, uh, the evolution of redox fluxes on Earth has changed through time and is intimately coupled with the evolution of life. Okay, so thinking about planetary serpentinization, um, what is the flux? Um, one question we, ask, we have to ask is, what is the abundance of materials that may be serpentinized? So this is something that uh, McKinnon and Zelensky asked in 2003. Um, and this is a, a, a question that's coupled to the formation of these worlds. Uh, 
So this figure is showing the formation temperature of the object, the average formation, the bulk temperature of the object as a function of size. And here I've indicated the sizes of Enceladus and Europa as vertical lines. Uh, and I've set horizontal lines um, showing the, the um, critical transitions from the stability of serpentine to olivine and the melting of forsterite and phaolite. Um, H corresponds to the qualitative heat retention um, um, that is typically assumed to be between 0.4 and 0.5. So what this is saying is that Europa is just marginally, um, based on the assumptions in this th that were made in creating this figure, just marginally at the transition of starting with an anhydrous interior. Um, now, if we add tidal heating, short-lived radionuclides, um, it's easier to imagine that it got hot. Um, the observation of um, signatures of a, a reduced ocean at Enceladus indicate that um, something like serpentinization has occurred. Um, so there's more to this story, but this is just to give you some flavor. Okay, so the other question is how much material is accessible by water? That is, um, if you have a, a periodic mantle, um, is all of it altered? For Earth, that is probably not the case. Uh, some detail in the last couple of days. And this figure is indicating in light brown the presumed um, depth of alteration. This is on a relative scale. Um, this is from work that I did now 10 years ago. Um, estimating the depth of fluid percolation in other objects. So the assertion is that in a cooler mantle on Mars, fluids can percolate deeper. Um, also that percolate the object cools. Uh, and so you should expect to have a greater reservoir of alterable material. And at Enceladus, the entire material may be subject to water rock alteration. Um, this is just a, a figure from a, a recent revisiting of that work um, that came out uh, this last year, 2016, envisioning the rocky interiors of these objects uh, as a function of pressure and temperature. Ocean depth, so Callisto and Titan and Ganymede start at very high depths, or very high pressures rather, because they have very deep oceans. Um, the result of that might be that in these larger worlds, um, the extent of serpentinization may be much less confirmed by observation. Um, so then we can ask, what are the corresponding heat and reducent fluxes from serpentinization? And so um, the amount of serpentinization, I will, I will indicate from uh, the figure from the same paper that came out last year. Um, this is looking back in time um, as the object uh, in question cools um, the um, more materials exposed, and so you can correlate that year per second uh, amount of release of heat and hydrogen. So just looking at the right of um, the right side of the figure on the right at uh, zero billion years ago, that's the present day, and I'm indicating uh, the range of estimated fluxes of H2 for Earth um, to quite a broad range, but it's less than the uh, net oxygen production on Earth as estimated or as described in. The you know, we can ask you, are there similar stories that we can construct for these other objects? I, I did that for Europa in this paper. Um, but, uh, you know, it's interesting to, to ask whether global serpentinization will um, be able to produce more hydrogen uh, on Mars, Europa, Enceladus series um, than is produced on Earth. Uh, the left side, the left figure is showing the serpentinization heat, the, uh, the lower curves of the serpentinization heat in milliwatts per meter squared. Um, the radiogenic heat um, is always much larger. So the, the amount of heat generated globally is not large. Perhaps it's nevertheless important for driving uh, hydrothermal activity. Okay, so um, that's some perspective that the other speakers can add to. Um, and so yeah, we've got some great talks lined up. Uh, Christophe Sotan, Elena Amador, Mark Neva, and Chris Klein with some uh, pop-up talks. Uh, I believe at this point we have um, uh, Julie Castillo, um, Adrian um, Brown um, and Penny Morrell. So, uh, Christoph, please take it away. Okay. Well, I have to unmute first. Uh, so, I have you. You, uh, you told me twenty-five minutes. Is that correct? Yep. Okay. So, I first and need. 
to share my my uh, webcam, I guess. Yep. Okay. First time I am using uh, the the webcam on my computer. Uh, interesting. And uh, well, so Steve asked me to um, give a talk more about the evidences for extraterrestrial hydrated silicates. Uh, and uh, at the beginning, I thought it was only on uh, on uh, ocean worlds, uh, but uh, then I decided to put something on Mars because I did some Mars uh, uh, work some time ago, and uh, we know that on Mars there are some hydrated silicates. Um, so the reason why we are interested in hydrated silicates, I guess uh, uh, we heard that yesterday and the day before. Uh, uh, it's about the emergence of life at places uh, where water and rock can react, uh, uh, and, uh, and it has been described yesterday. Yeah. And also there is this exploration of ocean worlds and to see places in these ocean worlds uh, where we can have this interaction between uh, uh, water and rocks. Uh, so I put together um, the different places in the solar system where we can uh, uh, has this kind of interaction. We know that on Mars uh, there was water uh, when Mars was young, um, I guess at the end of the Noachian period, uh, people mentioned. We know that there are river networks. Uh, it's possible that there was uh, an ocean on Mars at some point. Uh, of course, the Earth is our benchmark. Uh, and then, uh, I mean, on this on this line, uh, the, the the axis uh, goes as the amount of atmosphere you have on the surface. So uh, it increases with atmospheric density at the surface. And so that's why you have Titan, which is here. Uh, on Titan, the, the pressure at the surface is 1.5 bar, but the density is about four times the density that we have on Earth because the temperature is much smaller. And I will come back on uh, on Titan later, but uh, you will see that from the gravity data uh, that were acquired by the Cassini mission, um, we think that the interior of Titan uh, is made of hydrated silicate, uh, and so it's a huge, a huge reservoir of hydrated silicate. And then we have Venus. So for Venus, we don't have any uh, uh, evidence for that an ocean existed in the past. But Venus uh, had resurfacing about 500 million years ago, or maybe one billion years ago, and we don't know exactly what happened before. Then the vertical axis, uh, I put that as ocean rock exchange. Uh, and so on the vertical axis, I'm trying to get the green arrow. Uh, what do I have to do to get the green arrow? Uh, oh, yeah, just um, Chris, now. click on your slides where you want uh, the arrow to go. Oh, OK. Awesome. OK, thank you very much. Yeah, so um, here you have Ganymede. And Ganymede is an interesting case. And I will start with Ganymede in my next slide. Uh, uh, then you have Titan, which is here. Where, uh, I just mentioned the hydrated silicates. Uh, uh, I put uh, Europa, and uh, Steve uh, uh, mentioned Europa. You can see the ocean uh, on Europa is much thinner than the ocean we can uh, have on uh, Ganymede or, uh, or Titan. Uh, and then there is Enceladus. And something we have to keep in mind is also the size of the different bodies. Uh, so it's not respected here. I'm sorry, I couldn't uh, uh, make a nicer slide. But Enceladus is only 250 kilometers in radius. Uh, um, Titan is uh, uh, 2,575 kilometers, so it's about 10 times in, uh, the size of uh, Enceladus in terms of radius. Uh, and of course, the Earth is more than 6,000 kilometers uh, in radius, so it's uh, twice as large as Titan. Uh, Ganymede and Titan are about the same size. Uh, so the, you know, the questions we, we, we want to ask, and maybe several of them, but uh, what are the conditions uh, which for example, make Titan and Ganymede so different. Why Ganymede? Uh, you, we don't think that there is a hydrated silicate where, where is on Titan. We, it seems like we have hydrated silicate. But I just want to focus on uh, on, on the evidence. So I will start with Mars actually. Yeah. So um, oops, I'm not using the right button. Okay, here we are. Um, so on Mars, there were two infrared uh, mapping spectrometer. On Mars Express, we had uh, Omega, uh, uh, which uh, uh, which acquired the first, uh, I think, it's really the instrument that discovered the hydrated silicates on the, on the hydrated minerals, sorry, not silicates, but hydrated minerals uh, on the surface of Mars. And this is a map uh, that was published in 2007 and 8 uh, by Francois Poulet and John Mustard. Uh, 
And so there are the different places uh, where they identified uh, hydrated minerals. Uh, and then CRISM um, uh, had a much higher uh, resolution. Uh, and CRISM uh, found out uh, something like uh, 1,200 occurrences of hydrated silicate. Uh, these are the red points uh, you can see. So also most of the points are located uh, in the southern hemisphere of Mars, uh, which is elevated. You can see that there are a few places uh, in the northern hemisphere where apparently you have also some uh, hydrated silicate. And there may be you know, some uh, difficulty in finding the hydrated uh, minerals uh, in the northern hemisphere because Infrared, uh, um, infrared remote sensing can see only the few micrometers of the surface, or maybe the you know the few millimeters of the surface, and you have a lot of dust in the northern hemisphere. So it's not clear that uh, you don't have more hydrated minerals uh, um, just below the, the dust on Mars. Uh, then you know other information, and uh, I show that because. And Mars has a, a remnant magnetic field in the southern hemisphere. And one way you can create a, a remnant magnetic field is by having some magnetite crystallizing into a magnetic field of Mars. And we believe that Mars must have had a magnetic field early on. And of course, magnetite can be formed if you hydrate the, the minerals. So it's interesting to see that most uh, of the of the magnetic field is located uh, in the southern hemisphere, uh, which is also uh, more elevated, uh, and that's uh, what triggered uh, a study uh, by uh, Johan Kennel uh, in uh, published in 2008, I think it was in EPSL, uh, and uh, in this model we just compare the density of uh, hydrated silicate, uh, which is lower than the density uh, of basalt or the density of peridotite. Uh, and we looked at the difference in elevation between the, the northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere on, on Mars. Uh, and we determined some kind of uh, values for how much uh, hydrated silicate you would need in order to create uh, these variations. And that worked well also with the gravity data. So, and then there were some uh, thermal models uh, where we plot the temperature as a function of uh, pressure, or here you have the, the depth. Uh, so you have different uh, uh, thermal gradients uh, from uh, 20 Kelvin per kilometer, uh, which would be the highest uh, thermal gradient. Uh, and here you have a uh, 5 Kelvin per kilometer. Uh, and of course, the larger the, the gradient, uh, uh, the more um, the, the larger the temperature increases with depth. Uh, and then at uh, shallower depths, you will get the transition from uh, the hydrated minerals to uh, dehydrated minerals. So this is uh, one example uh, uh, where you have the uh, brucite and chrysotile, uh, which would be on top uh, with a very low density that we can see here. And if you have isostatic uh, equilibrium, then you create this, uh, this difference in topography. Um, of course, you know, on Mars, there are two, um, two explanations to explain the, the difference in, in topography. One is to say that the crustal thickness is different between the northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere. And because of the difference in crustal thickness, uh, then you create a difference in topography. Yeah? But the other way is to say that you have lateral variations in density. Yeah? And the gravity data by themselves cannot distinguish between the, the two models. Yeah? Um, it's possible that with insight, uh, with the seismometers on, on insight, uh, then we will uh, get information about the density uh, of the Martian crust. Uh, and we will be able to see whether or not there is a density difference between the southern hemisphere and the northern hemisphere, which of course would be great. Okay, next. So now we're going to move to um, icy moons, so ocean worlds. Uh, this is a, a slide I, I picked from Kevin and uh, the Earth in the middle. So now we have the right size for the different uh, icy worlds. We have Enceladus here. We have Ganymede here, huh? uh, Titan is here. You can see this about the same size, and uh, Europa is uh, is a planet here. So we, I start with uh, Ganymede just to explain how we get information about uh, the density uh, of, of the silicate core. And um, Steve led a study uh, which was published uh, in 2014. Uh, uh, um, and uh, what we what we know from the the Galileo mission uh, 
Um, we have some ideas about what we call the gravity coefficient, which is this value of C22. Uh, uh, so this is what is measured. Uh, and you can relate uh, this uh, gravity coefficient uh, to uh, a parameter which we call the love number, Kf, uh, which is here. Uh, and the other uh, parameters are, are well known, that the spin rate, that the radius, uh, uh, that uh, Gm is a gravity uh, constant times uh, the, the mass. Uh, so th this part is known. So from the gravity coefficient, you know this uh, love number. From, and from the love number, from, there is a relationship between uh, the moment of inertia from, along the spin axis, which is a C here, uh, and the love number Kf, which is here. Uh, so from the gravity, you know Kf, uh, and from Kf, you can get uh, the value of the moment of inertia. And the moment of inertia uh, is related uh, to the distribution of the density uh, as a function of the radius. And this is the uh, expression of the moment of inertia. So I can see the density here, which depends on the radius. Uh, and it's um, you integrate and you have the, the, the radius uh, uh, to a power of four. Of course, we also know the, the mass and we know the, the radius. So you have uh, information about uh, uh, the total mass of the planet. So when you, you solve, uh, um, of course, you have many more unknowns uh, that, uh, that you can solve for. But if you start with a differentiated uh, Ganymede, and on Ganymede, we know that there is a liquid iron in the center because there is a dynamo. Uh, uh, so you can build some thermal profile. So you, you would have uh, in the center liquid iron. Uh, the brown uh, uh, layer would be the silicate. Uh, and then, because we know the equation of state, which is um, important, uh, then you would have high pressure ice. Uh, we also know that there is uh, an induced magnetic field, uh, which is best explained by the presence of an ocean on Ganymede. Uh, that would be the dark blue here. And uh, at the surface, uh, you have the ice crust. So if you take the phase diagram of uh, water, which is uh, here, uh, um, the pressure from increases to the bottom. So this is the depth, and uh, this is in a steel paper. Uh, uh, so you can see that the ice one, uh, which is a low pressure ice, uh, has a melting temperature that decreases with pressure. Uh, and then at a pressure which corresponds to about 120 kilometers depth on Ganymede, you, you, you change uh, the low pressure ice into higher pressure phases, uh, ice three, ice five, ice six. Um, and so at some point when you plot the uh, thermal uh, gradient, uh, thermal profile, taking this curve here, uh, what happens is that uh, uh, the temperature increases with depth. Uh, and we take equation of state of water and we assume that we have adiabatic transfer. Uh, and you can see that the temperature increases. But at some point, uh, you cross the freezing temperature between the water, the liquid, uh, and the high pressure ice. In that case, that's I6. Uh, and that's why you have this uh, layer here. So if you add equation of state and the phase diagram, then you have some constraint about the, the layer of ice, and then you can determine what the density of the silicate and the, the density of the iron core. And for Ganymede, you find that you, everything works uh, really well with the density of uh, dehydrated silicate. You know, you take peridotite and uh, it gives a good value for the moment of inertia. So for Ganymede, um, we think it's uh, fully differentiated uh, that the water, uh, um, the H2O layer is differentiated from, from the interior. Okay, so now we move to Enceladus because we have um, quite a lot of information from Enceladus with uh, Cassini. First, we know, uh, so we have the mass, uh, we have the radius, the moment of inertia, so, sorry, it seems to, to erase the values, but the moment of inertia is 0 0.335, but if you take into account uh, non hydrostatic uh, uh, pressure uh, on the south pole of uh, Enceladus, uh, and that was a study by Bill McKinnon, and there was also a study by Gao and Stevenson in 2013. Then uh, you find out that you should take a value of 0 0.330 instead of 0 0.335. It doesn't change much the results, but uh, it, it's important. Then you take a model where you have a three layers. Um, then for dynamic uh, considerations, uh, um, you you can determine that the thickness uh, of the ice layer can vary from six kilometers at the south pole to 
to about 20 to 40 kilometers uh, at the equator. Uh, um, and these are studies by Bill McKinnon again in 2015, but there was also uh, a more recent study by um, Kadek et al. in 2016. Um, and then we have also some information about the density of the ocean. Uh, I forgot to mention that we know that there is an ocean on Enceladus, a global ocean, uh, because the uh, libration of Enceladus uh, demonstrates that you have a decoupling between the crust uh, and the interior. So there is a global ocean on Enceladus. Um, I want to precise that because I think in, uh, in the slide that Steve uh, mentioned before, uh, um, it was just a local ocean at the South Pole, but now we know that there is a global ocean. And so the, the density of ice, um, um, because there are geysers on Enceladus, uh, so we know also that the geysers uh, are um, spewing some water from, uh, uh, from uh, the ocean. Uh, so we can get information about the density of the ocean, and I guess Chris is going to say more about that. And then you solve for the mass and for the moment of inertia, and you get the values which are on the on the right. So for the silicate core, the two unknowns would be the density of the silicate core and the radius of the silicate core. And what you find out is that the density of the silicate core is something like 2,450. It can vary uh, uh, a little bit, uh, but it doesn't vary much. You know, it can be 2,500 uh, maybe or 2,400, uh, and the radius can vary by a few kilometers. But really, if you take these equations, uh, it gives you very good constraints uh, on the density uh, of the core. So in order to get this kind of uh, density, if you look at the density of uh, minerals, uh, if you take uh, antigorite, uh, which is uh, if you take only the magnesium uh, side of antigorite, uh, you find that the density is larger than that, actually. You have uh, 2,580. Yeah? If you start adding um, iron, then uh, you have more than 3,000 uh, for, for the density. So depending on the amount of iron, uh, you get density even larger. Of course, if you take brosite, uh, uh, the magnesium um, and member uh, has a lower density, but uh, if you include the, the iron, then it, it becomes much larger. So the idea is that actually the, 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 por the core of Enceladus uh, is porous. Uh, and so when you, when you look at the porosity uh, as a function of the iron number, uh, and if you take this value of 2,450 uh, for the density of the core, you find that even if there is no iron, uh, you have a density which is close to 10%. Uh, and if you add uh, you know, 30% iron uh, or iron number, which is iron divided by iron plus magnesium, if you take a value of uh, 30%, uh, then you find a porosity of 20%. Um, keeping in mind that the pressure in the core is very small, uh, it's, uh, we're talking about tens of MPA, so as Steve mentioned before, uh, um, if we take uh, what we know about the Earth and the depth at which uh, water can percolate, uh, you find out that uh, uh, the water would percolate into uh, Enceladus. And uh, you know, the next thing is that the porosity is very sensitive to, to the density of the core and, of course, to the value of the iron number. Um, so there have been some studies. I, I won't go into, into the studies, but about how much tidal dissipation can happen in the core. Uh, and there is a paper from, uh, which, is, uh, uh, which has been submitted uh, um, about the amount of tidal heating. Uh, and we get values which are just uh, huge uh, in terms of the amount of tidal heating in this kind of uh, a porous core. Um, the other thing that I think uh, Chris is going to mention that, but we, uh, um, hydrogen has been observed in the plume of Enceladus by the Cassini INMS, and of course, uh, just to show that you can produce uh, hydrogen uh, from the hydration of, uh, in that case, that's olivine. Uh, and if you transform a part of the Fa2 plus into Fa3 plus, then you create the hydrogen. But everyone knows that very well on, on, on this, uh, for this workshop. So I, I won't go into the details. But you know, that's another evidence uh, that this kind of reaction may actually can happen inside on Um I just put all the information on, uh, on one plot uh, uh, comparing Europa on Solidus uh, and the Earth. So let's see, the pressure is the vertical axis. Uh, it increases to the bottom. 
Uh, the temperature is the horizontal axis, uh, so it increases to the right. Uh. In red, uh, you have uh, a thermal profile for the Earth. Uh, so you go into the crust and then the temperature increases. Uh. Um, and I forgot to mention that this is the phase diagram of water. So you have the triple point of water, which is uh, here. So you have the ice on, on the left. Uh, you have the vapor on the right, uh, and you have the liquid uh, inside this domain between uh, the freezing temperature. Uh, here, by the way, that's high pressure ice. Uh, and here you have uh, <coughs> the critical point uh, of uh, water, uh, which is at uh, 650 degrees uh, Kelvin. So if you look at the Earth, uh, in the crust of the Earth, uh, if you don't take into account uh, hydrothermal circulation, what you find out is that the, the water is in the liquid phase. If you look at Europa, uh, the thermal profile is a green one. So in the crust of Europa, uh, you increase the temperature. At this point here, uh, the temperature uh, crosses uh, the melting temperature. So that would be uh, the interface between the crust and the ocean. And then uh, here you are in the ocean. So this uh, domain on the green curve, that's the domain of the ocean. And on Europa, there is not much H2O, so at some point you reach uh, the silicate uh, uh, core, uh, and this is the, this point here, uh, and then the temperature increases. And what I find interesting is that you find out that the conditions of pressure and temperature on Europa in the subsurface, in the, um, in the silicate core of Europa, uh, is very similar to what we have uh, in, the, in the crust of the Earth. Now, if you look at uh, Enceladus, uh, so that's uh, kind of blue dark uh, line here, it's the same story at the beginning. The, the ocean of Enceladus is in this domain here. Uh, and then if you increase the temperature, what is interesting is that actually uh, you are barely below the critical point. Uh, actually, it's even possible with the amount of tidal dissipation that you get that the temperature increases much, low, much faster uh, than what I plotted here. Uh, and actually, you cross the liquid gas um, transition rather than going into the hypercritical domain. So that may be a difference between Enceladus and uh, Europa, or Enceladus and the uh, terrestrial seafloor. OK, so let's see now Titan. How much time do I have, uh, Steve? I forgot to look. OK. Just, yeah, well, you're set to end at 12.55. If we can leave a little extra time for questions, that'd be great. Okay. So one major difference between uh, Titan and Enceladus, uh, sorry, Ganymede. So for Ganymede, the moment of inertia is 0 0.310. And for Titan, it's a 0 0.3414. And you know, the five is the uncertainty on the last number here. And you can see the so moment of inertia for Titan is much larger than the moment of inertia for Ganymede. So it means that Titan is much less uh, differentiated than uh, Ganymede. Uh, we have some additional information on Titan. Um, we were able to get the periodic log number from, uh, from gravity measurements. And the, it is a very large value. Uh, and it works only if there is a decoupling between the crust of Titan and the interior of Titan. So it's one way to demonstrate that there is a global ocean on Titan. And then when Huygens uh, descended into Titan's atmosphere, um, it uh, recorded uh, the electric field. Uh, and uh, there is a paper by Christian Begin et al. in 2012 uh, showing that the best explanation uh, is by having a conductor at about 65 kilometer depth. Uh, and the conductor we are thinking of would be the ocean. So uh, the crust of Titan may be on the order of 65 kilometers according to the interpretation of the Schumann resonance by, measured by the, uh, by the Huygens probe. So now if you do the same, uh, um, same calculations um, as the ones we, I showed for Ganymede, what you find out is that Titan's core has a density of 2,570 kilograms per cubic meters. Huh? and a radius of about uh, 2,100 uh, uh, kilometers. Uh, so it's, uh, the core is much larger than the core on Ganymede, and the density is much lower. Uh, and to get such a density, uh, the best explanation is to have a hydrated silicate. Uh, actually, this was already mentioned by, uh, 
by um, Julie Castillo and Jason Renina um, in uh, in a paper I think it was 2010. Uh, um, and uh, Julie uh, developed a model for the thermal evolution. You can see the value of uh, 2,080 kilometers here for the uh, for the silicate uh, core. Uh, and in the thermal evolution, uh, what they have, but they didn't know at that time, uh, what they have is that the, you know, the water freezes completely. Uh, but at that time, we didn't know that Titan uh, has an ocean. So actually, we have to now have models where we can still have an ocean on Titan, and there are ways that we can maintain an ocean uh, during 4.5 billion years. I won't go into the detail, but if you put ammonia, for example, which should be present because of the nitrogen in Titan's atmosphere, then you can maintain the ocean for billions of years. And at the end of their uh, simulations for uh, for the temperature inside Titan, then they find that you have uh, some transformation of the from, from some dehydration uh, of the silicate that the brown color that you find on the right. So I will go to the to the conclusions. Oh no, sorry. Yeah, yeah. What I want to say is that something uh, Steve uh, mentioned before is that actually the dehydration curve uh, of the hydrated silicate uh, puts some very strong constraints on, on the evolution of the thermal evolution of Titan because uh, you know around 900 degrees uh, Kelvin, then uh, you should go back to much denser minerals. Uh, which uh, uh, we don't observe on, on Titan. So the, the conclusion is that uh, on Mars, uh, we have some hydrated minerals at the surface. Uh, and the question is whether uh, there is some uh, hydrated uh, silicates uh, forming the crust. Um, the gravity data uh, from Cassini and from Galileo provide some constraints on the density of the silicate cores of the icy moons. Uh, so I mentioned uh, um, uh, Ganymede, Titan, and, uh, and Enceladus. Um, for Enceladus, uh, the silicate core would be hydrated and would be porous, and that would allow for a lot of tidal dissipation. Uh, for Titan, uh, the core would be also uh, hydrated. Uh, and I guess we will get more information uh, on Europa uh, with the upcoming uh, Europa multi flyby missions, which is also known as uh, Clipper. So that's what I I wanted to present for uh, for for the presence of, for the evidences uh, of uh, hydrated silicates on uh, uh, Mars and, uh, and icy moons. Thank you. Great, thanks a lot, Christoph. Um, <laughs> uh, do we have any any questions over the phone? Otherwise, there's there's a lot uh, in the chat window. Well, yeah, Julie made those. a comment uh, because she's on the line. Uh, it's true that in the uh, in the JRL paper, they did not model the thermal evolution of the icy crust. They were only interested in the evolution of the of the core. So that's why uh, you know they they don't have an ocean. Right. So could you um, give your your take on what is the the appropriate thermal gradient for early Milwaukee and Mars? Uh, well, I. There were some papers uh, by Baratu et al. I think a few years ago, uh, and they have a thermal gradient which was larger. Uh, I think it was 20 Kelvin per kilometer. But something we have to struggle with is uh, thermal conductivity of the crust. Uh, so I don't remember exactly what thermal conductivity they took uh, for for the thermal gradient. Okay. Christophe, so that, could that's you something say, that. Could, sorry, could you say the authors again? Oh, Baratu, B A R A T O U, and maybe X. Christoph, this is Chris. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, I had a quick question. What is your thoughts about the paper from 2014 by Balland et al., where they're arguing for a lower density, I mean, a higher density of Titan's core with a greater anhydrous rock fraction? Um. Yeah, because they take uh, what well, they look at the at the librations uh, and how they can uh, and also the the fact that Titan has an obliquity of zero three percent and so they try to explain the, the density. But I have discussed with um, with the group uh, and it's not very well constrained. Uh, actually, uh, they are yeah. Uh, so I have discussed with them and they are going back to a lower density for for, for Titan. I mean, the thing on Titan is that the gravity data uh, uh, can be inverted uh, without making the hypothesis uh, that you have hydrostatic equilibrium. So you get the value of J2 and the value of C22 uh, independently from each other. Uh, 
So even if you put some non-adrostatic uh, forces on J2, uh, you still have to explain the C22. And if you take the, the value of C22, uh, you find uh, um, um, a log number uh, which then gives you a density for the core, which is uh, much closer to the uh, hydrated gate. So th th there is some room, uh, you know, from uh, from their study. Yeah. Thanks. Great. Um, we had a uh, the what constraints there are on the iron content of the interior of Enceladus. <laughs> well, I guess that's a question for uh, for Chris. Huh? Chris. Uh, well, I mean the simplest model to start with is to assume a solar composition or CI chondritic ratio of Fe to magnesium. And then we can discuss possibilities where um, you could consider evolutionary processes in the formation of Enceladus, or we could use observations of things like hydrogen to try to understand how much iron might be reacting. So these are interesting issues. And something I, I want to, to mention, too, is that there is this paper saying that Enceladus formed very recently, only 200 million years ago. So if it formed, you know, in a Saturn environment, it's possible that the amount of iron would have been much less than what we can assume with solar values. Yeah, well, that's an interesting point. I posted the reference or the. Um, so I I wanted to know. Uh, do you know offhand what is the um, amount of heat generated in the porous core, the model that you referred to, the forthcoming paper? So it depends a lot on the viscosity you take uh, for uh, rubber pipes uh, or you know for uh, porous material. Uh, but when you compare with Similar material on Earth, uh, uh, Gabriel Toby and Gail Schoblech, uh, they had a poster at the last DPS, uh, they find values uh, up to 20 terawatt, uh, which is uh, gigawatt, which is uh, just huge for Antarctica. Right, okay. But, okay. Um, there was a question about the composition and salinity of the oceans. Uh, I will assert that we don't have great constraints, but I'd be interested in Christoph knowing what uh, your perspective is. Oh, for the ocean on Enceladus? Or in general, any of the icy moons? Well, for Enceladus, uh, I don't have the numbers in mind, but I guess Chris can uh, can comment. But we have some good ideas about the amount of, uh, uh, what kind of salts uh, do you have in Enceladus Ocean? Yes, that's correct. So I'll go over that in a couple slides of my presentation in about an hour. Yeah. Excellent. Uh... Oh, so there's a clarification about the ocean temperatures that you've considered, uh, pointing out that uh, Sue et al. Uh, infer that you have to have temperatures as high as 90 degrees somewhere in the interior. Uh, I think the the um, the question is what you know what are the um, what are the implications for the uh, the evolution of Enceladus? I have not. Okay, maybe Chris will touch on that a little. Well, actually, uh, well, if I go back to my slides on the, I mean, on Enceladus, uh, the the 100 degrees uh, is uh, somewhere here. Uh, that's right, here. So, uh, yeah, I guess that. Well, I I don't I didn't put any uh, any. Uh, um, convective model. So I haven't considered in that case uh, what would happen. But if you imagine that you have uh, convection uh, in in the in the core, uh, then the temperature would uh, remain in that range. And so Gael Choblet in his uh, simulations, uh, he has a 3D spherical code, uh, and he gets temperature which are consistent with this 100 degrees uh, temperature, 100 Celsius temperature. Christoph, this is getting kind of really speculative here, but is there any sense from Gabriel Toby's models of the localization of tidal heating? So should it be close to the ocean floor or 
uniform throughout the Rocky core or any sense or ideas about that? Um, well, the, the, the tidal, uh, well, it depends on the structure. It depends on how the porosity uh, varies with that. Uh, so I think, you know, you have a, a few knobs that you can turn in order to modify your models. Uh, uh, but uh, right now, the, uh, the, the density, the, sorry, the, the amount of heat, uh, of tidal heating uh, is, uh, is spread within the core. And uh, there is more tidal heating at the poles uh, than at the equator. Uh, but one question we can ask is why do we see only the South Pole uh, with activity and not the North Pole? Mark Niva clarifies that uh, he thinks that the SU 90 degree result uh, was in the core. Uh, where the subendinization is assumed. Uh, sorry, yeah, I right. didn't get the. I oh, Mark, Mark, the Mark, Mark just chimed. There's no question. He's just he's just clarifying about the SU uh, uh, result about the 90 degree temperature. Uh, the point okay. being that yeah, you have high temperatures in the rock, but in the ocean those those will kind of uh, okay. mix yeah. and equilibrate. Uh, I I should weigh in a little bit more about the salinity because I I glibly stated that. We don't have many constraints, but uh, um, and this is relevant to serpentinization. If you have a, a high flux of reductance from serpentinization, that you're going to drive the pH to a high value, and you would expect to have more dominance of chlorides than sulfates, for example. Um, and we certainly have measurements from Enceladus plumes that might um, tip us off about uh, hydrocarbon and uh, things like ammonia. Any other uh, responses to Christoph's talk? All right, well, Christoph, thanks very much. I hope you're able to stay around for the discussion. Yeah, and uh, Elena, please, uh, when you're ready. Okay, can you see me and hear me okay? Yes, Maybe? loud and clear. Okay. okay, great. All right, well, thank you very much for inviting me um, to present this morning. I really appreciate it. I'm actually defending my PhD tomorrow, so this is kind of a nice uh, productive distract, uh, distraction from that. Um, so Steve asked me to uh, talk about evidence for serpentinization on Mars. So my expertise is, is remote sensing and, and using near-infrared orbiters to um, describe the surface characteristics of Mars. And a lot of my focus has been looking for evidence for um, serpentine. And I think it's, it's really important because uh, it's one of these minerals that we can use uh, to really indicate, hopefully, a habitable environment. And we can detect it from orbit. So it can help constrain where we should be sending more detailed um, landers or rovers that have higher resolution instrumentation. So let's see. So we've all seen some version of, of this slide over the last few days, and um, I don't think I, I need to convince anybody here of the compelling, of why it's so compelling to look for evidence of serpentinization on other planets. Um, but from my point of view, uh, the thing that, that makes the serpentinization reaction so exciting as a remote sensor is that serpentine um, can act as an indicator mineral. By identifying this, this mineral, you have a good sense for the fact that serpentinization occurred and potentially this availability of hydrogen um, for interesting biological reactions. And it checks a lot of our boxes as far as a habitable environment. So for a long time, uh, Mars exploration has been driven by follow the water, but now we can actually say something like follow the energy and follow the geochemical environment. We can say more than just whether or not a surface was hydrated. And serpentine is, serpentine is one of these minerals that can help us do that. Um, so, uh, and looking back at all the other studies that have looked for evidence of serpentine in the past, as far as landers and rovers are concerned, there have been no detections to date with, with their instrumentation. Um, there have been observations of iron serpentine and noclite meteorites, um, and this was probably an impact-induced um, serpent serpentinization. And then from the big picture global scale, there actually have been quite a few uh, orbital identifications with near-infrared spectroscopy. Uh, there was a big search, uh, a study in 2010, which kind of did a global search for serpentine across the planet. 
and by Bethany Elman. And we found that serpentine was observed in a range of different terrains, um, typically in melange kind of uh, rework terrains in southern highland craters associated with ejecta or within uh, the walls of, of, of crater rims. Um, and then more recently, there have been more observations of serpentine along tectonic boundaries by Kristin and Viviano Beck, um, just south of Alice Marineris. And then the really exciting one from an astrobiological standpoint, I think, uh, is the observation of serpentine within uh, Noachian bedrock in stratigraphy. So it appears to be found in situ where it would have presumably formed, which from, an, from a habitability perspective is really nice because you can actually go to the place where these reactions were occurring. So the way that we do this, uh, just for people who aren't uh, used to thinking about uh, defining surface composition on another planet, is we use near-infrared spectrometers or thermal infrared spectrometers to get a sense of what the top, very top layer of the surface is composed of. And luckily for us, serpentine is actually um, uniquely identifiable in near-infrared and thermal-infrared uh, actual data. So it has these really, let's see if I can get my pointer, there we go. It has these, um, these absorptions that are diagnostic if you find all of them in the reflectance spectrum of its occurrence on the surface. And so we can use this to map out where it exists. And then uh, additionally, there are other minerals that are often associated with serpentine and serpentinizing environments on Earth that also have um, diagnostic spectral absorption. So you can kind of use all these minerals as a suite and all together to look for where serpentinization might have been occurring. So here's a map of, of where all the surface occurrences of, of serpentine have been detected. Um, for the most part, they're, they're found in these isolated regions, um, it, detections have actually been quite rare using just traditional uh, near-infrared analyses of the data. Um, there's not very much, there are not very many occurrences. There actually are a few more down between Isidus and Hellas Basin that I don't have mapped here, but um, it's still quite rare. So for the most part, these occurrences that I have mapped are these melange trains, these impact craters, um, not in stratigraphic sections. The only ones that we find within a complete package are these ones here whoop, in, um, in Nili Fosse. Let's see if I can do this without. There we go. So Nili Fosse um, has this really nice stratigraphic section uh, that I'll get to where we find serpentine. So on the left, I'm showing a, a thermal infrared um, multispectral image that is basically showing you um, surface composition at the bulk level. And what we see at Nili Fosse, um, here are the fractures associated with Nili Fosse in case um, you're not used to looking at, at in this region. But these, these magenta units that um, we see in the thermal infrared are indicating these really um, olivine-rich basalts that are quite expansive um, with about 40 weight percent olivine. And it's the chemistry of those olivines are, are shifted towards more magnesium-rich composition. So there are these really expansive olivine-rich basalts, and here I've laid out the um, just the compositional stratigraphy we see in the region. And on the bottom, we have this olivine-poor basalt that has some um, phyllosilicates, and then on, on top of that, are where the really interesting is where the interesting unit with respect to serpentinization has occurred. So there's this olivine-rich unit, and it's been variably altered to magnesium carbonate, serpentine, talc, saponite, and these have been identifications that people have been making over the years with, um, with studies of the near-infrared and the near-infrared. Um, and, and we can actually map them out and see where they're actually occurring. So what I'm showing here is the distribution of magnesium carbonate, serpentine, talc and saponite across the Nili Fosse region. Um, and these are aggregated from all the studies over the past few years, including my own. And what you find is that, um, let's see, the green, the green um, boxes are indicating chrism stamps where, um, where we see evidence for serpentine. So serpentine is still pretty rare in Nili Fosse, but it's found widespread across the region in general. 
There's a lot of evidence for magnesium carbonate, and there's good evidence for talc, a talc saponite phase as well. And the way that we identify these, again, are with these, uh, these spectral responses in the near infrared. And on the left, I have um, what the spectral types look like in Nelly Fosse. And then a, another study that I've done in collaboration with Billy Brazelton and Deb Kelly here at the University of Washington was taking rocks from the Lost City hydrothermal field, um, so an active serpentinizing system on Earth, and trying to characterize those rocks using the same types of measurements we have for Nelly Fosse. Um, and, and what we found is that we see the same types of the same spectral types in both regions. And so you can kind of use these these spectral signatures as um, a proxy or a, a key for a, a potentially serpentinizing environment. So it's it's all these spectral types together that kind of tell you, oh, we we probably had some sort of in situ serpentinization occurring in Nelly Fosse. And, but when we start looking for these um, absorptions, so if I go back to, so this green line uh, is the spectrum that indicates the serpentine bearing surface. And the diagnostic absorption is this little guy here at 2.12, which is really weak and it's pretty hard to find. And, and we found that it was, it was pretty difficult to find it, even in places where other people um, see it, it's, you still really have to um, dig around and, and, and try and find those absorptions. And it was really quite rare. And so our question is, um, is serpentine really so rare on Mars, or are we just missing it in the spectral data? Um, is, it, is it hard to find, um, or is serpentinization rare on a global scale in, in Nili Fosse? And then the other question is, is Nili Fosse unique? You know, are there other places that show these spectral suites that would indicate serpentinization? Um, how how um, common were these locales where serpentinization was occurring on Mars? And so if we go back to our original map of where others have seen serpentine, all these detections were made using just traditional CRISM um, analysis techniques that, again, um, the spectral absorption that is diagnostic of serpentine is, is really weak and really hard to find, and it's, it's very time-consuming, and um, by-hand analyses can take minutes to hours. So what we did was apply um, some new data analysis techniques to the CRISM data set um, using factor analysis and target transformation, which essentially it's similar to principal component analysis, that you can take your, your CRISM data and really um, take that complex spectral data set and reduce it to the um, significant uh, spectral components of an image. And in the past, people have done this and, and found that um, it's very successful in finding these weak diagnostic absorptions similar to what we see um, in, in Nili Fosse. So, so we applied this technique to the entire CRISM data set to see if we could find new occurrences of serpentine. And, and what we found, if we go back and forth, is we could corroborate the past identifications of serpentine across the globe. And then we found additional ones. Um, so for the most part, um, there, the serpentine is occurring in the southern highlands. Um, as Christoph showed, that's where most of the hydrated minerals are identified on Mars, um, just for uh, the reasons of dust coverage and observational issues. Um, and so we find uh, serpentine across the southern highlands. We corroborate where other people are seeing it. And, um, and then we also look for this other spectral suite. So we look for places with magnesium carbonate and this talc saponite phase in hopes of finding other regions that show this grouping of minerals that might indicate um, this in situ serpentinization. And for the most part, we didn't find that talc Magnesite and serpentine um, correlated very much spatially. They were found distributed across the southern highlands, but um, they weren't all necessarily found together. And the serpentine observations kind of fell into these two categories. Um, they were either found in these kind of isolated occurrences across the southern highlands, or, or like with Nili Fosse here, they were found together. Um, some other places like Marth Vallis and um, Pleuritus Rise also kind of showed this interesting grouping of, of um, detection. So these isolated occurrences, although still quite rare across the, the globe, um, were found across the southern highlands. They're well distributed. The target transformation fits, so using this new technique, we're, we're really clear in their identification, so we're confident that it's there. Um, they're typically associated with crater ejecta or discontinuous layers, so really reworked terrain. 
so not necessarily found in situ, and they weren't necessarily found with these other spectral types we were interested in. And the target transformation detections were really telling us that the serpentine is occurring at really um, low concentrations. And then there are these other regions where um, the, the geologic and the mineralogical context makes a lot more sense. So, for example, um, oh, that's not working, but down um, in this, so here's Valles Marineris. Um, there are these detections of serpentine along the Thaumasia Highlands, and what the thought is that this is an uplifted, tectonically controlled terrain. Um, so perhaps we're we're seeing a uh, serpentine brought up from the subsurface and exposed here, um, but definitely tectonically um, mediated. Uh, another interesting area was Mars Vallis. Um, there are quite a few kind of low concentration detections of serpentine associated with uh, carbonate and one detection of talc down in the south. Um, and this is just interesting because Mars Vallis has some of the highest abundances of phyllosilicate on the planet. Um, it's observable both in the near infrared and potentially in the thermal infrared, which tells you it's really high concentration. So using this new technique, this target transformation and factor analysis, we are able to show that there is even potentially serpentine there at these, these low concentrations. And then the target transformation and the factor analysis, this, this independent technique also found um, abundant serpentine, again, in nili fossae. So if we go back to my first map that I showed, so these are the distributions of serpentine um, using just traditional chrism analysis. So there are three occurrences um, previously. If we look at what the target transformation and the factor analysis find, they corroborate those, in, those initial um, three detections, but then they find um, that serpentine is actually much more pervasive across this region. And in particular, it looks like it's conscious concentrated um, in the eastern portion of Nili Fosse, and this is where those really um, high concentration olivine rich basalts are actually located. And so um, a model put forth by Cristina Viviano in 2013, I think, um, is still pretty um, consistent with what we're observing with both the target transformation um, and the previous analyses, is that you started with this initial uh, compositional stratigraphy of having this, this pre-weathered olivine-rich basalt, and over time, this was likely hydrated, and you, you had serpentinization forming um, serpentine. But then now we have this associated magnesite and talc, um, which likely implies that you had subsequent carbonation in the region. And so what about other olivine-rich regions? Why is Nili Fosse so special? Well, um, there are other abundant olivine-rich areas on the surface, other ultramafic regions, mostly associated with these large impact craters. And the idea is that you're, you're potentially tapping into the mantle when you have these huge impacts and you brought um, olivine-rich material to the surface. Um, but we didn't find all uh, serpentine necessarily associated with them. So you don't see serpentine down on the edges of Argyre Basin. There's only a few exposures here um, near Hellas Basin. Um, so there doesn't seem to be this relationship between uh, the olivine-rich basalts on a global scale and serpentinization other than in Nili Fosse. So perhaps Nili Fosse is this unique um, setting uh, where you had this sustained kind of um, surface um, serpentinization and subsequent carbonation. Um, so kind of the, the, the overall summary, I'd say, of this global search for evidence of serpentine is that um, overall, exposures um, that are detectable from orbit are quite rare on Mars, but they are still found across the Southern Highlands. Most of those occurrences are in these isolated, um, reworked terrains at really low concentrations. And, and maybe this is telling us that there was an early um, global serpentinizational process happening when Mars was more geologically active. Um, and since they're not associated with those other olivine-rich regions, perhaps this was happening prior to those large impact, impact events. So, you know, really long time ago, 4.1 billion years ago in the pre noachian And so this is really interesting from a planetary evolution perspective, but it's less satisfactory, I'd say, from an astrobiological um, um, perspective. And then this work and then past work, I think, really point to the fact that Nili Fosse is this a unique site on Mars and that having this large-scale regional serpentinizing system was probably pretty rare. 
um, at least for what, from what we can detect at present day. Um, and so I think from a habitability standpoint, this is a really intriguing place to go study in more detail. Um, it certainly is, is pretty rare, so it, it seems like a very interesting place to go look. And regardless of whether or not life uh, formed there, I think it has a lot of implications for, um, for planetary evolution on Mars. Um, so my, my last kind of thoughts are there are quite a few um, open-ended questions, I'd say, with this study. From the data we have now, it's really hard to say whether or not any serpentinization in early fossae was sustained or episodic. It's not clear if it came and went or how long it lasted. There's still a lot of olivine left, so clearly, you know, all of it wasn't serpentinized. It's hard to say what the mineral abundances are um, with the data we have, so I think this really makes it an even a better case for going there with a, a landed mission that has higher um, instruments and mineral, um, kind of, uh, better techniques for determining the mineral abundances. And then it's still not clear how well biosignatures are preserved in these environments necessarily. So um, as I, you know, the last few days listening to everyone talk, it sounds like the most biologically productive areas in these serpentinizing systems are where um, the, the, the altered fluids are interacting with fresh water or where you're getting mixing. And so it's not clear where that's exactly happening in Nilifase. Is that actually happening in that olivine-rich layer, or um, do we need to look down watershed at where these fluids would have been coming out of the surface? Um, and I think a lot of the research that people are doing in Oman and um, at Lost City and actually drilling into the bedrock will give us a better idea of, um, of where we should be looking as far as biosignatures from this environment. So I'll leave it with that. I, I think there probably is a lot to discuss, um, and I'll take all the questions. So let's see. Okay, thanks so much. The questions are coming in. Um, so let me just uh, start at the top. Um, so there's a question from Adrian Brown, whether you found anything in, um, uh, in the thermal infrared. Uh, there was a response from Benjamin Boutel uh, saying he thinks that the resolution was too, was, uh, the outcrops were too small. Is that yeah, correct? so, yeah, the, in the thermal infrared, there are two thermal infrared spectrometers that have been to Mars. There's the test instrument, which actually is pretty high resolution and would be able to observe serpentine, the, the spectral resolution, but unfortunately the spatial resolution is kilometers in scale, so there's no way we'd be able to see um, those serpentine outcrops. And then uh, the CMIS instrument has uh, a better spatial resolution, it's still about 200 meters per pixel, but the spectral resolution is so poor that you wouldn't actually be able to say whether or not there was serpentine. Um, that's better at telling you bulk silica abundances. So unfortunately, with the data we have today, or the, the instruments we have available today in thermal infrared, we don't see them. Okay. I had a related question. In the visible spectrum, uh, there are large outcrops of serpentine that I know of in California. I've often wondered about uh, seeing those in, in you know, spatial mapping. I'm wondering if, um, if that's a reasonable thing to pursue and uh, if current instrumentation at Mars is not up to the task. Yeah, I, I haven't looked for those outcrops um, in Earth data. I imagine that, um, you know, for Earth stuff, you really, vegetation really gets in the way. <laughs> and um, so I, I would be worried that, that you would be flooding those spectral absorptions with, with other um, interfering factors. But I think there are uh, folks in Bethany Elman's group looking in Oman, at the outcrops in Oman, and trying to correlate um, you know, spacecraft, aerial spectral data to what they actually see on the ground, and really trying to understand what you can observe from orbit and how that relates to what's actually on the surface. And that'll have implications for what we see um, on Mars. That. Does okay. that help answer the question? Yeah, so people yeah. are thinking I think we... about that scale, that scale issue. Okay, that's great. Um, Tom clarifies that uh, serpentine is usually associated with ultramavic rocks, not all being rich basalt. Um, and you're, he's wondering if there are instances where we see serpentine and basalt on Earth. Well, I, I think, I, I don't know off the top of my head of serpentinization in, in just basalt aren't ultramafic. Um, but for Mars, 40% olivine uh, in a basalt is pretty ultramafic, and that's about as good as you get on the surface of Mars. Um, and so I think it's it's pretty intriguing that we do see these spectral responses for serpentine, and they're diagnostic, so we know serpentine is there in, 
in some form. I don't, we don't know the concentration of it, but it's it's detectable um, in 20 meter pixels from CRISM. Um, so it's a little unsatisfactory, but okay, 40% uh, of the uh, from Mars. <laughs> okay, so point of clarification. Uh, Brian Hynek was asking, uh, in your survey, it seemed like there were some previous serpentine detections um, that weren't represented in your map. And um, yeah. is that so? And if so, why? Yeah, I didn't see those before uh, a few days ago. So those will be absolutely added to my to my map. Um, and in looking at where they are, they kind of fall between Isidus and Hellas Basin. So those will absolutely get added. That's on my part. Great. Uh, yeah, so Ava, I believe this is Ava Stoken. Uh, I was wondering if the system was subaerial at the time or uh, or if it's subsurface that was then exposed later. So I, I believe that this is all subsurface. So the olivine rich basalt is actually capped by another unit, this, this capping unit of an olivine poor basalt. And all of this would have been covered at some time, and now it's being exposed to the surface. So um, this, the olivine rich unit probably wasn't on the surface when it was serpentinizing. Okay. Uh, Cody Lazar chimes in about uh, clarifying um, this question about olivine rich basalts and states that uh, uh, seen it some, sometimes rarely in uh, thin sections. Uh, not sure what, surely in bulk rock equilibrium, you're seeing this as well. Um, and student just found uh, serpentine pseudomorphs in the San Bernardino Mountains. Oh, cool. Okay. okay. Um, let's see. The is it possible to define the minimum aerial extent or degree of serpentinization necessary for a diagnostic spectral signature um, and and the associated carbonates? Yeah. Let's see. Um, it's that's really hard. It's really hard to get uh, concentrations in near infrared data because of scattering effects. So the best you can do is say, okay, this 20 meter pixel in CRISM um, has the spectral signature. And then you can hopefully go in with higher resolution visual data and try and piece out which outcrops might actually be, um, be producing that signature. Typically, I think what, what people Say is about 10 volume percent uh, phyllosilicate is what you is the minimum that you could probably see within these, um, these spectral signatures, um, but it it it's hard to to actually get an aerial extent without knowing exactly where the outcrops are. Okay, obviously an important. Thing to consider for the future. Uh, it seems like this is yeah. something that we're going to keep learning more about as uh, as continued as Mars exploration continues. Um, so we just have a little bit of time for the break. Uh, Adrian Brown mentions that there are some ground studies in Australia. I'm wondering if Adrian, if you could elaborate on that. Oh, sorry, uh, I I missed the question. Uh, well, so I'm asking Adrian to elaborate. Uh, I'm not sure what uh, ground studies in Australia is referring to. Oh, and I'm just reading one of Brian, Brian's questions about um, clarifying. So some of Bethany and Christina's detections don't have detections in my study. So um, in Bethany Elman's 2010 paper, she had some probable detections. She had her confident detections, which were those stars, and then probable detections, which were squares. And um, to me, I think that so that spectral spectral signature for serpentine is so um, dubious that um, it could just be that those ones that she thought were probable um, maybe weren't real. Um, it's, it's really hard to find it in the near infrared. So I think it says something that. The ones that she was confident in, we independently confirmed as well. And maybe that helps constrain whether or not her probables are real. And then there are a few of Christina Viviano's that we also didn't um, corroborate. Um, and again, I'm not, I can't say why or we did or we didn't. It might just be that those spectral signatures are uh, a little bit more dubious, I guess. 
Okay. Uh, we are into the, the break period, I, I, but I do want to just uh, touch on the last questions that just came up, and then uh, we can continue receiving questions during the break. Um, there was a question about the concurrent formation of the carbonates with the um or whether they formed afterward, and if there's any way to really constrain that. Yeah, so the carbonate can form under a few different scenarios, right? Like you could actually just get the alteration of olivine from surface water um, to to um, produce the magnesium carbonate, or the carbonate again could form from the subsequent alteration of serpentine to form talc and magnesite. And I think the fact that we're seeing the talc with the magnesite and the serpentine kind of put everything together in this um, nice little package that implies carbonation. But it could be that there are were multiple mechanisms for forming that carbonate in um, in Nili Fosse. There are other exposures of magnesium carbonate across Mars that aren't necessarily associated with um, talc. So I don't think we're we're not necessarily only seeing one mechanism. If that makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense. So we, we shouldn't necessarily be biased by our expectations from Earth. Um, yeah. yeah. Okay. I, I think Cody's comment is a, is a clarification on uh, on uh, your uh, the, the earlier discussion about uh, the occurrence of the salt and serpentine. So, all right. So let's go to our break. Um, we will reconvene just a minute or two after 10:35 with uh, Mark Niva. Uh, so thanks again. Thanks for having me give this talk. So for those of you who don't know me, I'm a postdoc at Arizona State University, and uh, I'll try to give you a brief overview of uh, and thanks for having me give this talk. So for those of you who don't know me, I'm a postdoc at Arizona State University, and uh, I'll try to give you a brief overview of serpentinization on small bodies uh, from three standpoints. First, what we know from meteorites. Um, second, what we know from modeling work, uh, and third, the ground truth uh, from the exploration of series recently by the Dawn spacecraft. So first, uh, we're very lucky with small bodies because we have three return samples um, in the form of meteorites, which are basically fragments ejected uh, when these asteroids collide uh, and they, they fall down to Earth. So the most primitive of these are uh, called chondrites, and you see a couple of uh, photos here on the top. Um, show that you have this dark matrix um, essentially made of anhydrous silicates, uh, olivine, pyroxene, uh, and you also see these interspersed uh, bright specks like this one here, uh, which is metal. And so essentially these, these mineralogies are quite similar to ultramatic rocks uh, plus the metal which on the earth uh, has sunk to the core. Now there are other contracts called carbonaceous contracts um, whose mineralogy is quite different, uh, much more hydrated. And you can see here uh, a breakdown of the mineralogy uh, of these uh, of CM chondrites, a class of carbonaceous chondrites named after the, the Mary meteorite. Uh, and, and these are predominantly serpentine, um, so magnesium serpentine in green and uh, iron serpentine in uh, black grayish. Uh, they still have about 10 to 30 percent of uh, pyroxene and olivine, uh, but but their mineralogy is uh, substantially altered. So this is evidence that we have from uh, meteorites for uh, serpentinization uh, on small bodies. Uh, we also have direct evidence from uh, remote observations, and this is as uh, early as the late 70s, um, showing a, a data points. Uh, of an infrared spectrum of series. So you see the data points here, and then the lines uh, are carbonaceous contract spectra uh, to try to match uh, these data points. And there's a, a, some absorption at three microns that's characteristic of uh, bounds OH, uh, and so evidence of water hydration. Uh, and since these first observations, um, this then has been seen on, on many other asteroids between Mars and Jupiter, mostly in the outer asteroid belt. Um, so quite early on, uh, even the, the early 60s, uh, it was established that uh, most likely these carbonaceous contracts are the results of the aqueous alteration uh, of ordinary contradict material. Um, 
and so that the the, the olivine, the pyroxene, the metal gets turned uh, into serpentine and associated magnetite, etc. Um, and the, the picture um, that's been developed and that's um, pretty much still the same today is that um, the small bodies that I created ice and then hydrosilicates um, heated up either via endogenic uh, processes due to radioactive decay or um, exogenic processes uh, due to impact um, and that this melted the ice, uh, the resulting liquid water reacted within hydrosilicates uh, to, to hydrate them. Uh, and this is how we got the material that we see in, in carbonaceous contracts. So essentially, wherever there was liquid water in contact with chondritic material, we should expect uh, to see serpentinization. Um, now, different modes of aqueous alterations have been postulated, and, and the reason for this is that we see uh, different classes of carbonaceous contracts. Uh, the CI contracts, for example, named after the Ivuna meteorite, um, show uh, an, a bulk elemental composition that's really close to that of the sun, uh, and presumably the bulk solar system. Uh, and so it's inferred that the alteration uh, in this meteorite was isochemical, uh, and most likely that the fluid that, that altered um, the anhydrous silicate didn't really move, uh, everything stayed in place. Whereas the CM contracts uh, are uh, slightly fractions uh, in terms of elements compared to the bulk sun, uh, and so it's inferred that the fluids that altered these, um, this material uh, moved with, with respect to it, either uh, in terms of a, a single pass flow where uh, then the fluid vaporized space, or perhaps in a more in a closed system uh, where you had uh, multi-pass convection kind of in a hydrothermal circulation pattern. And uh, more recently, there has been uh, new, new ways, uh, new physical settings for alteration postulated like, uh, like this one, um, the giant convecting mud balls of the early solar system where instead of having uh, chunks of rock, uh, the rock is assumed to be more like sand or mud in fine suspended grains that convect with the fluid. And so you can have a pervasive alteration throughout the body with the, the rock moving with the water. Um, so although we, we know that there has been such a alteration, um, there remain often questions like where uh, is there or was there a good water? And how long uh, does the water persist? Is it just for a few millions of years after the formation of the solar system, um, driven by short-lived radioactivities? Or did it persist for billions of years? Is it still going on today, for example? Um, so about where the water is, uh, we can just look around in the solar system. I, I've put here a number of uh, bodies of astrobiological significance, plus uh, Ceres and Pluto, which are probably of astrobiological significance too at this point. Um, and the, the striking feature here is that um, once you go beyond what, what's called the snow line, um, like as the orbit of Mars, uh, water is able to condense. And so these objects will have created uh, uh, large amounts of ice uh, as evidence that their densities, which are all around two grams per cubic centimeters. So essentially they're half water and half rock. Um, so the, the amounts of water are not really the, the issue. The, the question is, uh, where is there liquid water and how long did the, the liquid water persist? Um, so a very useful tool uh, to help us uh, determine how long there was liquid water uh, are thermal evolution models. Uh, essentially, these are uh, numerical models that compute the internal structure and the internal temperatures uh, inside these, these bodies over time. Uh, and Christoph gave you a, a, an overview of this a little bit earlier. Um, so let me go just very quick into how these uh, work. Essentially, they compute the production of heat uh, inside these objects will be the small body, uh, Mars, uh, icy worlds, and so on. Um, so a chief heat source for small body uh, is radioactive decay. You don't really have any tidal heating. Um, this can drive uh, heating in the, in the rock, um, potentially differentiation between rock and ice. Uh, if you melt the ice, for example, um, they compute heat transfers in the rock, in the ice, um, melting and freezing of water, and they're bound uh, by a surface temperature 
which is usually set up by the, the distance between the object and the sun. So this is a typical outcome of such a model uh, from a paper by Julie Castillo and Tom McCord, 2010. Um, so this is a model for Ceres. Uh, Ceres is an object that's about 500 kilometers in, in diameter with a density of about 2.1, 2.2 grams per cubic centimeter. And so what you're seeing here uh, is a map of color map of temperatures, uh, not composition. Composition is shown to the right uh, with, with the core and the shell. And uh, the, so the temperature are mapped according to the, the scale bar at the bottom. And um, these temperatures change from formation on the left to the present day on the right, uh, and on the y-axis uh, from the center to the surface. So a, a general feature of these uh, outcomes is that first, the temperatures increase over time. And this is because radioactive decay exceeds um, the loss of heat by transport uh, throughout the body. Transport here is mostly by conduction. Um, but then at some point, after a, a billion years or so, this is a log scale uh, on the x-axis, the inside uh, of series cools uh, because radio radioactive heating um, is not powerful enough. It decreases over time. And so transport starts um, uh, becoming dominant, which is why it has cooling. Now, the point of interest here with, with these models is to see what happens in the shell. Uh, do you have temperatures in the shell sufficient to melt ice uh, and have liquid water? And with this uh, color scale here, this happens when you transition from the, the green to the orange. And so you can see there's a little bit of liquid water early on. It stops uh, maybe after about 10 million years in this particular model. Uh, so, so these are a tool to tell us uh, if, if we have water for aqueous alteration. Um, switch here. This is a simulation that we did uh, a couple of years ago with the same assumptions uh, for series, but the model that's completely independent, uh, just to show you that um, these are, are pretty robust results. What about smaller bodies? Series was about uh, 500 kilometers in diameter. This is an object that's only 50 kilometers, 45 uh, in radius. And um, what you can see here is the colorful regions uh, have a temperature that's sufficient to melt water. So everything uh, in blue, yellow, red is above 273 Kelvin. Um, and so you're seeing the same object over time evolving. And just about uh, after about 10 million years or so, uh, the zone where water can be liquid uh, almost disappears. And so the time during which you can have liquid water is actually really short here. Again, just about Ten millions of years. What about further out in the solar system? Uh, this is a simulation for Pluto's moon Charon. Uh, Charon's fairly big compared to what we've seen, uh, about uh, 600 kilometers in radius. Uh, and this is another way of showing the results. Uh, you, you're looking at temperatures of, as a function of radius at different times, uh, but the outcome is again pretty much the same. You have uh, heating uh, between zero, one, two billion years, and then cooling afterwards. Um, but what's important to notice here is that um, at the base of the ice, there is always a region here where temperatures are sufficient uh, to have liquid water. And uh, here is a diagram of how much liquid water you have over time uh, in terms of uh, Earth oceans. And essentially, you have about 1% uh, worth of Earth oceans persist uh, pretty much until the present day. So of course, these assessments change a little bit depending on model assumptions. Um, but the, the bottom line here is that you can have uh, liquid water depending on the size of the object, the distance from the sun, uh, the, the rock content, meaning the, the, radio, the amount of radioactivity, uh, anywhere between a few millions of years uh, and possibly until the present day. So um, this is important because these models, even though they predict liquid water, they didn't really take into account uh, what that means in terms of, of the geophysical evolution of these objects. Once you have liquid water, uh, presumably it starts interacting with the rock, uh, especially if uh, there are fractures uh, in the core so that the water can percolate down. Um, so potentially it could uh, get heated and uh, float back up uh, in hydrothermal circulation patterns. 
Uh, and of course, you have water rough reactions, which can produce or consume antifreezes. Uh, and so all of a sudden, you see all these uh, feedback arrows pop up in these loops uh, that are, aren't really taken into account unless you model this explicitly. Uh, and just to show you, this can uh, really profoundly model the, the temperature evolution and the structural evolution uh, of, of small bodies. So on the top here is the same simulation I showed you before of series. Uh, so with the smooth heating and then smooth cooling. And at the bottom, uh, this is uh, with the same assumptions, except that you have fracturing in the core and hydrothermal circulation. So it starts off, uh, a series starts off by heating again, but as soon as you reach uh, the melting point of water in the shell, um, the model has the water percolate through the core and circulate down. And uh, this hydrothermal cooling of the core really uh, very efficiently transports heat back up uh, into the shell where this heat completely melts the shell. So it's kind of a runaway production of liquid. So you have very uh, pervasive aqueous alteration here. Um, and so the, the, the model computes serpentinization. Uh, the, the thing is that the radioactive heating cannot really keep up uh, with this very vigorous uh, cooling by convection in the core and then in the ocean. And so the ocean uh, ends up freezing after maybe only 50 million years, 100 million years or so. Uh, and so you're back into the initial state uh, where the ocean is frozen, um, there is no more circulation. And so the, all the heat transfer is conducted again. Uh, because that heat transfer is not so efficient, uh, series heats up again because of radioactivity until you reach the point of melting water and the same cycle starts again. Now the peak uh, of activity here looks very narrow. Uh, this is just because of the log scale. The, these periods are always about um, 50 to 100 million years in length. And you have these alternating cycles of um, a cool uh, frozen series that's heating and then a molten uh, water layer that's convecting and hydrothermally circulating. Uh, and very efficiently cooling. And this continues until uh, reductive decay just becomes too weak uh, to, to ever melt liquid again. Um, so notice that the structures are very different. Here, the, the interior is pervasively serpentinized, uh, whereas here, uh, the core is mostly made of dry silicates. Uh, in addition, in the model that accounts for uh, circulation, you can have liquid water intermittently for much longer time scales, billions of years as opposed to only in the very early history uh, otherwise. Okay, so this is uh, what models predict. What about the ground truth? Um, so in the past year, a uh, series has been explored by the Dawn mission, uh, which returned uh, great images like this one. Uh, so showing a very dark surface, very cratered, uh, but with these very intriguing uh, prominent bright spots here. So Dawn carried this infrared spectrometer uh, that acquired uh, spectra in the near infrared uh, with several features. Uh, this is a spectrum of the average uh, surface of series. It's very uniform throughout except for the bright spots. Very little variation. But the spectrum can be interpreted uh, as a mixture of serpentines, ammonium bearing clays, and carbonates, which is quite unique um, in, in the solar system, especially for the ammonium bearing clays. And series very low albedo, only 3% in the infrared uh, can be explained by the presence of a dark absorber, which is still unidentified, but it could be organics, uh, magnetite, perhaps sulfides, or maybe a mixture of all that. So this is showing that series is blanketed by products of uh, circulation. What about the bright spots? The spectra are quite different, showing features um, that are characteristic of carbonate salts. Uh, so here, sodium carbonate, as well as um, ammonium bicarbonate or ammonium chloride, perhaps. And so the question is, where, where did all this come from? This is this looks like uh, a fluid, salt left from a fluid that, that vaporized or froze, and only the, the solutes are left over. So to find out, um, I did some geochemical modeling trying to react different starting compositions of chondritic rock, either ordinary chondrites or CM chondrites, reacting with 
fluid, uh, either pure water or cometary water. By cometary, I mean um, water with a little bit of carbon and nitrogen and sulfur compounds uh, that are seen in comet gases. And so I did this modeling with the Freak software, trying to um, see at equilibrium what happens to these mixtures at different temperatures, pressures, and water to rock ratios. So I'll just show you, show you a couple of results here. Um, so first we're looking at an average spectrum of a series dark surface. And uh, these little pie charts here are the equilibrium mineral assemblages for different pressures uh, spanning the interior of series to be halfway through the interior and temperatures uh, from zero to 200 Kelvin uh, Celsius. And the colors match the labels to the right. Uh, so this uh, light blue here is serpentine. Uh, and you can see that, uh, especially at cold conditions, we reproduce pretty well what's being observed uh, by dawn, at least qualitatively. The serpentines, um, the ammonium bearing clays, uh, which we see only at low temperatures, they seem to be the result of the substitution of potassium ions, which are leached into the fluid and substituted for by ammonium, uh, which either comes from the fluid in, in, if the fluid is cometary and has nitrogen at the beginning, or uh, nitrogen from organics. If we start with uh, carbonaceous chondrite compositions, uh, we form also carbonates uh, in purple a little bit, uh, as well as any of the possible dark absorbers like organics, magnetite, uh, and sulfites. Now what's uh, really cool, is that the fluids in equilibrium with these assemblages um, also match what's being observed at the bright spots. Uh, so you see oxidized carbon, uh, the pH is about 10 to 12 in these fluids, uh, the model pH. And uh, so we have a mixture of uh, bicarbonate and carbonate, sodium ions, a uh, little bit of uh, chloride ions here. Um, and what's not showing is uh, this dark compound here uh, in the pie charts, it represents reduced carbon, which is mostly dissolved methane. Uh, and so there is no spectral evidence for, for methane at the surface. However, uh, there is some structural evidence on series of methane clathrates, which are um, quite a low density and strong material that would explain um, the internal structure of series as determined by the gravity science of Dom. Okay, so um, I'm pretty much finished. Just to give you a summary, uh, we know from uh, meteorites, carbonaceous chondrites that sample some small bodies uh, beyond the snow line, uh, that they contain mostly serpentine. Uh, so they're evidence of uh, pervasive serpentization, mostly likely uh, early in the history of the solar system. Um, models uh, predict that water rock interaction took place in those small bodies. Uh, anywhere between a few million years after the formation of the solar system to a few billion years, and perhaps until today in, in the larger bodies, um, such as possibly Ceres, uh, Charon, etc. Uh, and we know now that Ceres' surface is blanketed by spermized material, um, that the associated fluids are perhaps expressed at the bright spots, um, and perhaps uh, this is kind of tentative that the alteration was called. And with that, I'll take questions. Thank you very much. So we have one question, uh, or at least a week at Steel. You were describing uh, thermal models um, that, that are leaching materials. She points out that uh, displacing potassium could uh, influence the heating and cooling cycles. I think. The, the association there is that potassium itself is uh, radiogenic. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if you'll cover this in your public talk, but um, the idea that you, you would displace the, the heat source, potassium being one of the radionuclides, long lived radionuclides, from uh, the rock, which is what's commonly assumed, into the ocean. And so you might be able to generate heat directly into the ocean, and that changes a little bit um, how the the thermal evolution proceeds. And uh, thanks, thanks so much for your overview of chondrites at the beginning. Uh, uh, sur early serpentinization of those carbonites, um, or, uh, chondrites rather. Um, the so you know we we hit upon this in other discussion of other talks that those are the feedstock presumably of all of the 
outer solar system bodies and possibly also inform uh, the composition of the terrestrial planets. Um, do your models predict that Sirius would have become anhydrous due to early heating? Uh, they don't. They, they predict that it would stay, once it becomes hydrated, it stays hydrated. But just to touch on, um, on chondrites as, as building blocks of planets, um, I think it's a, it's a great question, though. We, we don't know for sure if the building block was, uh, if the building blocks were uh, chondritic in, in composition. For example, on, on Enceladus, uh, everything looks more uh, silica rich and, and magnesium rich. Uh, it seems that uh, more than, than chondritic. And so uh, maybe the starting material differs a little bit for series, though it looks like you can reproduce the, the current composition really well, with, starting with, with chondrites. So not a bad assumption, but so just a word so, of caution, yeah. Yeah, so it's um, it seems like a be that much of the material that formed series was serpentinized prior to series formation. It'd be interesting to figure how to prove or disprove that. Yeah, yeah. Again, we've we've tried um, different starting compositions, either already serpentinized or not yet serpentinized. And you get pretty similar results either way, just because the, the models are equilibrium models. And so the, you know, you're just getting the thermodynamic, uh, equilibrium goes all the way. Um, but maybe there were kinetic barriers to certain, to, to the reactions for the reactions to proceed. So I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, Mark, question. Are sulfates found on series? <clears throat> no. Not as, uh, not as far as I know. Neither sulfates yeah. nor sulfides, actually. Do you have any ideas about why sulfates are so prevalent in CM and CI chondrites, but they may not be at series? Um, well, Julia, I might want to chime in on this. Uh, I believe that there has been a, a heated debate as to whether the sulfates are, um, were their pre-impact on Earth or if they're the result of alteration after the falls, um, but I'm not an expert on this, so. Yeah, I, I, I can go this if you want. Uh, regarding the detection of sulfates on Ceres, uh, there's an ongoing study uh, that is trying to put um, a detection limit on sulfates, and if they are present, they are in extremely small abundance. Uh, and as Mark uh, noted, I mean, it's more likely that we have um, sulfites. Uh, in terms of the sulfates in meteorites, uh, also, I mean, I agree with Mark, the, uh, he, uh, the debate is whether the sulfates were really uh, formed on the parent body or on Earth. And Mike Donensky, uh actually showed that even if you preserve um, the ICM chondrites very well under nitrogen pair and so on, even in these conditions, um, a little bit of oxygen makes it very easy to turn sulfide into sulfate in, uh, in meteorites. So it's, it's most likely that the sulfates are of terrestrial origin in, in these materials. Yeah, thanks for making that clarification. I, I cited this paper by McKinnon Zelensky uh, uh, in my introduction. Uh, they spent a lot of that paper um, pointing out some of the uncertainties or assumptions of salinities in different uh, extraterrestrial oceans. Uh, and that, that point about uh, terrestrial origin of sulfates is, is a really critical one. Yeah, and there is a, a paper, to Gunel and Zolensky, 2001, that looks uh, at this question, uh, that's really focused on uh, CIC and meteorites and, and uh, I think they make a firm demonstration that, again, the sulfates are of terrestrial origin. Great, thanks. Uh, well, with that, let's let's trend, let's uh, thank Mark again. And, uh, we'll transition to our, our next talk, uh, the final invited talk by Chris Klein. Hey, Chris. Okay, like thanks, Steve. Web... I'm... Oops, sorry about that. Um, it looks like your webcam's. Uh black right now. If you want to uh, double check if the right device, in the upper right hand corner of the video pod, there's a little drop down menu, and there's an option to select camera. You might be on the wrong camera. 
All right, trying that again now. Okay, if it doesn't fix itself quickly, we'll just uh, we'll forget the camera. I can certify that Chris is not a robot. Thank you, Steve. <laughs> okay, Chris, I want to take away from your presentation time. So why don't you go ahead and just uh, get started. We'll all imagine your handsome self. All right, just imagine me waving my hands around. <clears throat> okay, well, uh, thanks, Steve, for inviting me and everyone for tuning in to the very end. Some of you may be spilling over into lunch right now. Uh, so I'm really pleased that we've kind of marauded our way all across the solar system. It's been pretty impressive. And now for the final talk, I thought we'd return back to Saturn, where we have a, a bunch of data that can help to inform us about the geochemistry of Saturn's moon Enceladus. So that's what I'll be discussing in some detail for this presentation. Uh, is it not advancing? Can you use the arrow at the bottom? Oh, yeah, they yeah, see it. All right. <clears throat> right, so Steve started off the session with Europa, so it's, it's sort of fitting that we first talk about Europa. Uh, for many of you, you're probably aware that NASA is starting this new initiative of a program studying ocean worlds of the solar system, and Europa is the, the most obvious example that everyone has had in their heads for the past 20 years or so since Galileo found evidence for a uh, subsurface ocean. But now a, a new kid has come onto the block, Enceladus, and now we're also talking about ocean worlds across the solar system. And whenever I sort of describe to my friends or family Enceladus, it's, it's always kind of a, mis a mystery to them what Enceladus might be. So this is something that many of my family members in San Diego, often think about when I tell them about Enceladus as some kind of tasty meal, which is kind of apt for lunchtime discussion. And so, kind of at, at you know in the 2010s, as we're getting close to the end of the decade, we we basically had four worlds emerge besides the Earth, with which are thought to be the key candidates for searching for extraterrestrial life in the solar system. As many of you are aware, there's been intense exploration of the planet Mars. And Mars is very similar to the Earth in terms of being a terrestrial planet, lots of dry land, and some evidence of water-related features. And then in the outer solar system, three bodies have emerged as the, the superstars, if you will. Europa, as I mentioned, Enceladus, and then Kristoff in the second talk of the session discussed Titan. So these are really the, the key objects of focus, and NASA is recognizing this. We have the Europa uh, flagship mission to launch later next decade, and then there's calls for competitions to send missions to either Enceladus or Titan in the next decade as well. We're just getting near the end. It, it breaks my heart to say it, but we're almost to the end of the Cassini-Huygens era. So the image on the left shows probably the, the, the highest detail quality image of Enceladus from the Voyager 2 flyby that zipped past the Saturn system in the early 1980s. And at that time, there, were, there was discussion about whether some interesting um, recent geological activity might be occurring. And at that time, recent was thought to maybe be something like in the past several hundred million years. And you can see sort of at the, the bottom right-hand corner of that left-hand image, um, there, it, it's kind of a smooth surface. It looks different from a lot of the moons of the solar system like our moon, which are very heavily cratered and battered from the um, formation of the solar system. Oops. Sorry to pause for a second. It looks like my Adobe crashed. No worries, Chris. I'm getting you back on as a presenter, and you should be good to go. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much. And so the right-hand image shows now what our perspective has become with the Cassini-Huygens mission. The Cassini spacecraft is 
flown by Enceladus many times. And these are some of the highest resolution images of a very interesting part of Enceladus at the South Polar region, which I'll show on the next slide. Oops, I mean, two slides from now. So this slide here basically just summarizes the whole Cassini orbital tour of the Saturn system. So the Saturn insertion was in 2004. The launch was in 1997, got there in 2004. And you can see these um, top images of the orange ball are all the flybys of Titan, which have been a, a very heavily heavy point of emphasis for the, the mission. But in the second row here, you can see the Enceladus flybys. So we've been privileged to have 23 relatively close flybys of Enceladus that range anywhere from about 50 kilometers at closest approach to several thousand kilometers away. So the, the earliest flybys where a lot of key discoveries were made what were in 2005, and we had, we had a sort of a brief hiatus, and then a, a series of intense exploration sort of in the middle of the tour, and then our final flybys of Enceladus were in 2015. We had the close E21 flyby in October, and then the final further flyby, the E23 flyby, was in December of 2015. So that's it for our um, Cassini observations of Enceladus. We're now gearing up for the end of the Cassini mission. You can see these for uh, 2017, all these Saturn images shown on the slide, which indicate that we're, we're transitioning into the proximal phase of the mission where the spacecraft is going to be disposed of in a a fiery crash or burn up into Saturn's atmosphere. So that should be kind of exciting later this year. Uh, so here's just a close up image of Enceladus, uh, kind of improving upon the Voyager 2 flyby. And I just want to show you, so there's, you can see this fe feature I've outlined here called the tiger stripes. That's a, those are features of intense interest. And whenever I talk to <clears throat> friends or family or other colleagues about Enceladus, the way I like to refer to Enceladus is as the Harvey Dent of the solar system, where you kind of have this two-faced perspective of a very heavily cratered ancient uh, equatorial or, or mid-latitudes, and then you have very young terrains in the South Pole. So this image has been flipped on its side, and these tiger stripe features are found on the South Polar terrain. One of the early discoveries was by the um, Cassini Sears instrument. So this, this instrument measures thermal infrared emission and the equilibrium surface temperature of bodies at Saturn with cold ice is around 75 Kelvin. And so you can see some of the surrounding terrains in the South Pole region are around 75, 80 K, but then these tiger stripe features, which are, which are mapped to quite high detail, show very high excess thermal emission with temperatures, black body temperatures of around 200 Kelvin. So that was kind of a clue that something very bizarre as far as the solar system was happening at the South Pole. And in 2005, we indeed found what could be considered the biggest discovery of Cassini. I know there's been a lot of great science at Saturn and at Titan in particular, but one of the most surprising findings was that there are active cryovolcanic eruptions of material that are happening right now at Enceladus and have been ongoing since 2005 and probably earlier. And so you can just see the smattering of images here where we call, this feature is called the plume. And the plume is actually comprised of over a hundred geysering jets that are feeding material from Enceladus's interior, warm material at that, to form this plume feature. And in the right-hand image, you can see just how large this plume is in comparison to Enceladus as a whole. The, the, Low gravity really helps to accentuate how far this material can shoot out from Enceladus. And this finding has cemented Enceladus's place as the smallest geologically active body that we have evidence in the solar system. And it really joins an exclusive club. So most of the bodies are kind of like our moon that are, are sort of dead or very have very feeble levels of activity, but Enceladus joins this club where we found active volcanism today. So you kind of have the earth, we're aware of silicate volcanism where silicate minerals are being melted and erupting onto the surface. And then when you move out to the outer solar system, Mark mentioned you have the snow line. So that's really the, the domain of ices that dominate as surface materials on these types of bodies. And so we call it cryovolcanism for this cold variety of extru extrusion of materials. 
We previously had evidence at Neptune's moon Triton for eruptions of nitrogen N2 material, and now Enceladus provides us with an example of H2O-based cryovolcanism. Now, I won't go into too many of the details, but from the past 10 years or so, this slide basically summarizes in a cartoon form what the emerging paradigm is becoming for what is sourcing this plume of material and what the uh, nature of the subsurface might look like on Enceladus from different lines of evidence involving gravitational measurements like Christoph mentioned, compositional measurements, different plume modeling type studies. So what we think we have here is a rocky core of material it's probably porous, as Christoph mentioned, overlain by an ocean of liquid water. And then there's a still very poorly understood plumbing system where there are different cracks and other features like that, which are presumably formed by tectonic stresses, which are serving as conduits for ocean water to get close to the surface where it can subsequently erupt as these geysers that form the plume. And then we have the Cassini spacecraft performing fly-throughs of this plume and sampling that material. So I'd like to just discuss and basically review what we think we know about the composition of the ocean on Enceladus, because there were some questions earlier about well, what's the chemistry of this stuff. And we think we have a pretty good idea, at least at a high order level, of what the chemistry is. So one instrument on Cassini is known as the Cosmic Dust Analyzer, abbreviated as CDA. And this is an impact ionization mass spectrometer. So what happens is the um, spacecraft flies through the plume at anywhere from about eight to 20 kilometers per second. And the ice grains that are in the plume impact onto a plate and some of the different molecules and ions in the um, plume material are ionized and then detected by this mass spectrometer on this instrument. So what this shows is this shows an example of the mass spectra that are acquired from that sampling process. And it look, for those of you in chemistry, it looks kind of similar to um, electrospray ionization where you see kind of like the dominant ionic peaks of just single elements like sodium plus or potassium plus as prominent features. And then you have a um, bewildering array of different types of combinations you can have between the cations and different anions that might be present in those salt mixtures. And the second instrument we have on Cassini is the ion and neutral mass spectrometer or INMS. And this instrument basically sniffs out the, the uh, neutral species that are in the plume gas to give us an understanding of what its composition might be like. So this spectrum shown here is just taking in the plume gas in mass and then observing all the different mass peaks that you can find. And then we've ab been able to model the spectrum. So you can kind of think of the model as unbaking the cake, where we have just everything coming into the mass spectrometer at once and then we're trying to attribute these different mass signatures to individual species or the fragments of these species that are produced during electron impact ionization. And the color scheme basically shows the different peaks or fragments that are attributed to different molecules. So you can see that the dominant species in, is in blue, so that's water vapor. And then there are other more minor species like methane, ammonia, CO2. And then at higher masses, we think we see evidence of organic signatures, just simple hydrocarbons, which we're thinking are fragments potentially of larger organic structures in the plume. And this slide here basically summarizes at a quantitative level what we think the, the CDA and INMS data are revealing or constraining about the composition of Enceladus's ocean. So these plume particles are not, as, as you could see from the previous mass spectrum, they're not pure water ice. It actually looks like they represent flash frozen samples of a salty liquid that's dominated by sodium chloride and with a little bit of potassium and um, carbonate species. On the right-hand side, as I mentioned previously, it looks like ma mainly water vapor, and then you have CO2, methane, ammonia, some organics, and possibly uh, free molecular hydrogen which we'll talk about later. And at the lower left-hand side of the image, you can kind of see for comparison what terrestrial seawater looks like. So it appears from the CDA data that Enceladus's ocean is more dilute than seawater on the Earth. And then another marked difference is seawater on the Earth actually has a fairly appreciable concentration of sulfate and not as much bicarbonate, 
And Enceladus's ocean seems more like a soda ocean where you have a, a decent amount of bicarbonate and sulfate has yet to be observed. So these are interesting similarities and differences between the ocean we know and love and the one we're finding at Enceladus. So some of the, the general science themes that have been revealed by Cassini, this is some work that I did trying to constrain the, the pH of this ocean. The pH is really a fundamental geochemical parameter that quantifies how acidic the water is. And basically, I, I use this idea of the carbonate system as a pH meter from space. So we're not so fortunate to be able to just take pH paper or pH probe like we would on the Earth and stick it into the body of natural water and sell it. So we have to try to be a little clever and we have to sacrifice some robustness so we can try to do this using a spacecraft measurement at 50 kilometers away from the surface, flying through the plume at 10 kilometers per second. But we can actually solve this carbonate problem, which is familiar to all of us, through uh, rainwater. So rainwater, although we've heard of acid rain, natural rainwater is weakly acidic because, as shown in this left-hand uh, figure, you have CO2 dissolving in rainwater, and then it self-equilibrates among different carbonate species to create weak acidity. So at Enceladus, it turns out we have the data to use that, that right-hand figure showing the distribution of carbonate species, and we can invert that problem to take observations of CO2 in the plume gas and the uh, carbonate salts in the plume particles to try to figure out well, what's the self-consistent pH for those measurements. So that's what I did in this, this next slide here. You can see on the left-hand image, I try to find, well, where's the sweet spot of self-consistency? And when you do that calculation, you can see that line there around 7.5, that's neutral pH. And that blue shaded region is that self-consistent region for Enceladus's ocean based on the observational data. So it appears to be elevated from neutral pH by several units, which indicates a fairly high degree of alkalinity or, alkalinity or a high pH. And the interesting thing about that is um, when you compare it to this image on the right-hand side here, this was done by a study by Misha Zolotov, and I think Mark's calculations are broadly consistent. If you just try to figure out well, what's the equilibrium pH, if you, if you hit calculate for equilibrium between a chondritic rock composition and liquid water at zero degrees C, you can see that that top curve goes to roughly pH 11. So it seems like there's general consistency between what an observationally based model that from the carbonate system is giving and what just theoretical geochemistry would predict based on an expected composition of the system. And so high pH waters aren't too common on the Earth. Seawater's a pH about 8, but if you look hard, like many of you folks have, you can find these locations in limited um, geologic terrain. So one of the, probably the most famous one is the uh, Lost City Hydrothermal System in the Mid-Atlantic with elevated pHs from about 9 to 11. The uh, Ophiolite in Oman, so I wrote pH of 11.5, but I think measurements have been found, found to go up to about pH of 12 or 12.5. And Enceladus, so it seems like it could be in the land of 11 to 12. So it seems consistent with this notion that serpentinization is a key process controlling the geochemistry of that ocean. And then another theme that's emerged from the observation, observational data, this is very recent data from just a couple years ago, where um, the cosmic dust analyzer observed these very small nano-sized particles of almost pure silica that were found floating in free space around Saturn. And when these folks did a detailed investigation, they were able to trace the most likely point of origin of these silica nanoparticles to Enceladus. So it appears that Enceladus is erupting ice grains that contain nanometer-sized silica particles embedded in them. And in the right-hand image shows an attempt to use the observations combined with a model to try to constrain the concentration of silica in the source fluid. And the conclusion was that the source fluid is actually pretty silica-rich. And so in, in 2015, a couple papers appear proposing that the mechanism of pr producing these nanometer-sized silica particles involved hydrothermal activity at Enceladus, where um, 
Hot water could circulate through silicate material in the core, leach out silica at high temperatures, and then when that water mixes with cold water at the ocean floor, the solubility of silica would drop dramatically and silica particles would crash out of solution and form precipitates, sort of like you see at um, hydrothermal vents on the Earth. And so this slide here basically shows um, some experiments that were performed to support that interpretation. So these investigators performed laboratory studies in a gold bag where they took a mixture of olivine and encetite in roughly um, CI chondritic proportions, heated that up with hot water, and then they measured silica concentrations. And they found these data points shown here in black. And it's roughly consistent with the classic buffer and assemblage of serpentine and talc for this kind of intermediate silica activity type situation. So that, that all seems to hang together fairly well. Um, probably a lesser known study is Misha Zolotov, the, the theoretical geochemist. He was looking at theoretical calculations trying to understand if you could have a um, chondritic or ultramafic system which may not really have a lot of silica in the rock and whether or not there could be enough silica leached out into a hydrothermal fluid to form silica precipitates by the proposed cooling mechanism. And he expressed a little bit of hesitation. So just to kind of give you all a, a total story that the um, hydrothermal model appears to be the most well-developed current paradigm model, but there are some dissenting opinions to this story. So let's keep that in mind as we move forward. And because you know, there's, there are some questions, and this notion of hydrothermal activity is kind of a, a big claim, so it would be important to find, or to at least look for as much evidence as possible to test this notion of hydrothermal serpentinization at Enceladus. And so one thing that our group has been looking at is potential analog sites for Enceladus on the Earth. And Lost City has emerged as a, an attractive candidate, and when you look at Lost City, it has these warm waters that are high pH like we deduce for the Enceladus Ocean. And what's also notice, notable about Lost City is a high concentration of molecular hydrogen in these hydrothermal vent fluids, about 10 millimolar concentration. Here's a, a theoretical perspective too from just sort of like a petrological modeling perspective. You can look at different uh, mineral combinations that could buffer the hydrogen activity in hydrothermal vent fluids. And so for a serpentinizing system, you might expect these top, this top, top curve to apply where you have serpentines being oxidized to assemblage of, say, magnetite and talc. So at elevated temperatures, this type of analysis suggests higher concentrations of hydrogen in the fluid. And so we've been very interested in this possibility of testing for hydrothermal activity at Enceladus. And we specifically designed a unique operational mode for the Cassini INMS instrument with using the open source aperture of the instrument, which would hopefully allow a more robust measure of hydrogen in the plume. The problem is that there's also water vapor in the plume and there's potential mechanisms to convert water vapor to H2 in the instrument if you use the normal closed source. So we use the open source to try to circumvent that issue. And we're, we're finishing the touches on a paper and it's been submitted. So stay tuned for the results of that story. Uh, just quickly, I know I'm running out of time here. So while we were performing the data analysis of the E21 INMS data, I was also performing a geochemical analysis of all the possible sources of hydrogen at Enceladus because Maybe it's premature to say H2 equals hydrothermal. So we looked at all sorts of possibilities, like if you could have primordial H2 that's somehow trapped in the ice on Enceladus, or if you could form H2 by radiolysis of water, either in the interior or on the surface of Enceladus. And the basic conclusion we found is that these possibilities are severely constrained or inconsistent with other sources of observational data or theoretical arguments. So we think the conclusion, if we find H2, that could be a useful tracer of hydrothermal activity. And I'm not gonna to touch upon this slide too much. All I wanted to basically point out is I think Enceladus provides a natural laboratory for testing a lot of these notions where 
you can think of serpentinization as the inorganic foundation for supporting life by making molecular hydrogen that can drive all these fascinating disequilibrium processes of synthesizing organic molecules, which can then eventually support ecosystems like we find on the Earth. So there's been a lot of debate about the origin of life, and much of it is philosophical. And I think Enceladus is the next logical place to go to really put a lot of these ideas to the test. So I strongly encourage that to be considered. And for, just for the final part, part of the slide, I thought since this last presentation, uh, what's next? It turns out from Cassini, we've learned a lot. We've, we've basically almost completely checked the habitability part of searching for life. We think there's liquid water, there's evidence for organic molecules, possible energy sources, free molecular hydrogen or other sources of chemical energy that could be generated by hydrothermal activity. So what do we do next in the search for life? Uh, this is a really nice graphic by Brett Sherwood basically mapping out the trajectory of exploration <clears throat> along with my age just to kind of emphasize that this is sort of a real long range program where we're starting with Cassini and we basically have nailed down habitability and the next step you can maybe envision is to do something similar to the Europa multi flyby mission where we do in-depth uh, investigation of the plume but using modern instrumentation to really start to look for signs of potential biomolecules in the plume and eventually getting to things really the really exciting possibilities like returning samples from the plume or possibly once I'm gone uh, sending submersibles into the ocean to actively look at these hydrothermal systems. So a lot of interesting possibilities for the future. And I think I'm going to just stop there. I do have a um, movie. If there's enough time, Mike, you can play the movie. If not, I'll be happy to take questions. Yeah, Chris, are you okay if we play it muted and you take questions while it's playing? Sure. Yeah, let's do that. Um, yeah, Chris, we got a lot of great uh, questions and comments online. Um, first was from Julie Castillo wondering, um, I'm curious about this too, do you expect the plume composition to reflect the ocean composition directly or could there be some kind of fractionation during plume formation? Yeah, that's a good question. So it appears that the, um, the ionic composition of the salt particles may be a pretty close match based on this notion that you could have flash freezing of ocean water as droplets are erupting into a low pressure environment and making their way into space. Uh, if you're trying to relate the gaseous composition to the ocean composition, you actually have to start worrying about um, condensation of material in the vents. And that becomes a, a more difficult modeling exercise to try to constrain what the composition of the gas, how that might reflect the original ocean composition. Uh, just to give an example, I think we kind of got led astray when we just took a direct look at the gas and said that looks like the source because the plume gas is actually quite enriched in volatiles relative to water vapor. So it got many people thinking that it must mean clathrates, but that did not consider processes that remove water vapor when material is erupting through the relatively cold ice crust of Enceladus. All right. Uh, I, I wonder, even for the aqueous portion, if, if um, there may be some fractional crystallization. You, the, what you described sort of requires an assumption that the fluids are directly in contact with the source of the plumes, which may be the case. Yep. There could be. Yeah, I think the next step is if somebody's so inspired, it'd be really useful for this community to perform experiments where you study catastrophic and violent boiling and degassing and freezing of liquid water exposed to vacuum conditions and to see you know what how that composition might be reflected if you were to produce an artificial plume in the laboratory when you start with a known ocean composition i think that'd be really interesting and useful yeah that's great uh well so pop up talks i'm going to try to summarize some of the questions that followed uh, so Hector um, pointed to some experiments at Virginia Tech and the University of Toronto, pointed out the dependence of serpentinization on the ionic composition. You sort of touched on that in your talk uh, after the question was posted, uh, but I hope that's something we can maybe consider in the chat later on. Um, and Jen, along the same lines, evidence uh, for plume precipitates um, 
on the surface? Yeah, well, I think that's a really good question. So there were some early observations reported from the Cassini VIMS instrument. So this looks at the uh, near IR spectra, and they reported signatures of, of CO2 ice or icy complexes containing CO2. There, there have been various reports, I think, in the UV saying that there could be ammonia ice present on the surface, but that's, that's not really, I would say that's tentative evidence so far. Uh, beyond that, I don't think there's been any other spectral evidence on the surface of Enceladus. Good reason to go back. Um, Absolutely. Right. <laughs> uh, so Julie, Julie Huber similarly points to some, uh, well, she points to some other sites of interest where pH is not high. Uh, so that link to that paper is, is in the discussion thread. Um, another question about a working hypothesis on how to get pure silicate um, to precipitate from silica or serpentine, serpentine stabilized fluids. Yeah, I think that's a good question too. So it may be the case that we talk about serpentinization. The classical case on Earth, to my understanding, is to aqueously alter olivine to produce um, serpentine and brucite. On for a CI chondritic or solar composition rock, it's not quite the same as peridotite. The solar composition is actually a little bit richer in silica, and you can kind of think of as of a CI chondrite as more being similar to a peroxinite on the Earth. So it may be the case that there's a little more silica there than we might normally think of on the Earth, but it's still an interesting question to see if we can reconcile these observations of silica particles with possible models of aqueous alteration of rocky material. It could also be the case that maybe the hydrothermally reacted rock is not the primordial rock, but there could have been some kind of igneous differentiation or some other processes of mass transfer that might have fractionated Enceladus's core in a way that we don't presently understand. Yeah, so lots of lots of complexities to worry about. Chris German uh, uh, supporting the idea of wondering uh, how directly we can interpret the type of serpentinization, if any, uh, from the Enceladus observations and seconding other Earth analogs we should look at. Um, yeah, I, I agree with Chris German completely. Great. Uh, also, serpentinization likely responsible for nitrogen fixation to uh, ammonia, uh, or is there another fixation mechanism? Uh, it's possible. So if, if hydrogen is observed, then there is a strong thermic drive and there could be catalytic metals that could drive the conversion of N2 to ammonia. Ammonia has been detected in the plume. N2, interestingly enough, has not been observed. So the question is, does it, the ammonia represent a, a significant conversion of N2 to ammonia? Or could the ammonia just be a primordial species that has been preserved uh, until the present day? I think that would require a new mission to look at things like the um, anisotopic composition, for example, to try to understand the source of the nitrogen on Enceladus. Great. Uh, Chris, thanks so much for a really thorough and, and, and fun talk. Uh, we need to move on to the pop-up talks now. Um, so I'd like us to bring up our, our next uh, uh, speaker, and I believe Julie Castillo is going first. Oh, uh, I Adrian I was Brown Adrian, is going we can, first. We no, can switch right. if let's, you want. Let's, let's go with Adrian. Okay. The so Adrian, whenever you're ready, uh, just start your webcam and uh, take it away. Um, and just a reminder, we have about five minutes for each pop-up talk now, and we'll do about a minute or two of questions. So if we could try to stay on time, that'd be great. Adrian, and, uh, I think Adrian you might be muted okay. you on your now? phone. Okay. Can you hear me now? Right. All right. Okay. Yes, yep. we can. Great. Right. All right. Come in. There's the slide. All right. Okay. Okay. This is um, slide. Uh, this presentation okay. is just uh, going to be a short um, 
uh, the presentation is just uh, going to be a short uh, where this uh, NAI uh, presentation is of uh, where this uh, NAI uh, presentation is going on the city institute NAI team and on the city institute NAI team and, uh, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, we're uh, looking at low pressure uh, signalization uh, reactions and the relevance of not particularly um, observations of the Nili Tosso region. I'm just going to talk very quickly about this with four slides on the Western Australia as a uh, Four slides on uh, the Pilbara region in Western Australia as an analog. analog. Four, four slides on low pressure modernization. Four slides on the top carbonate hypothesis. And four slides on the 2020 landing site and in particular on Jezera Crater. All right, so we can find that. Uh, uh, okay, got can it. Can you use the arrow at the bottom of your screen? Okay, got it. I'm going to on the next page. Awesome. So, um, Pilbara is a ma uh, awesome. Mars analog. Um, so, um, Pilbara so is a ma uh, Mars analog. Um, so, this goes back to uh, 2005. Uh, uh, paper that I'll probably be using part of my PhD. We had a hyperspectral uh, visible near the red data uh, set uh, of an area called the North Polar Dome in Pilbara region in Western Australia. This is pretty famous as uh, what it says. Uh, uh, this is the area where the best is of all the stromatolites exist in Western Australia and in the world. I'll show this in a couple of moments. What we were trying to highlight uh, in this paper is alteration minerals that were in the North Pole zone that could be mapped um, and uh, have associations with uh, the strata that we found uh, at the North Pole zone. And these are these rocks are part of the Warawuna group um, at about 3.5 billion years old. So they're very similar in age to the Millet Poche rocks that I'll talk about uh, in a few slides time. Now what what are what I was looking for in the hyperspectral data set were alteration minerals that really stand out with very strong absorption bands. Um, and my um, general strategy uh, and approach when I was uh, trying to map these areas uh, was to um, go back to Sydney uh, each year and look at the remote sensing data set I had and then go back out in the, in the winter after the Pilbara where the temperatures became variable in the winter and try and follow up on discoveries that I've made using the remote sensing data set back in the computer lab, if you will. So I was very shocked to see this very um, uh, large absorption band, um, uh, uh, large depth absorption band in my second year of analysis. And so I was pretty excited to go out there the next year. When I went out there, this is what I saw. Um, can you see my cursor on the thing there? Okay, this is basically on the right hand side, you can see a pretty crappy. Um, yeah, okay, all right, I see, I see. Pretty crappy sort of uh, outcrop here. It's covered with spin effects. Here's my boots, the CIL. Um, and, and this stuff was what I was seeing this huge absorption there and from. Uh, and it took a lot of um, thinking to uh, work out what was going on here. Actually, what, what, what we're seeing here, to cut the long story short, is it's actually top carbonate alteration of underlying uh, olivine-rich commoditeite rock. Uh, so this is around 3.5 billion years old. And the top really stands out in the hyperspectral data set because it's very bright and it's very friable and it gets over everything. And so even amongst this, I, I know um, Elena talked about vegetation getting in the way of uh, absorption bands and um, signals in hyperspectral data. This, this Spin effects just really didn't affect the fact that the, 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 the help around it um, uh, really is uh, without. Okay, so moving on to the next slide. Um, this is an example of one of those stromatolites that, that are found in a layer that's just above the ultramafic laser layer that I was talking about. So this led to the talc carbonate hypothesis, which was a paper that we published in 2010. Um, and get that right. Well, we actually went back to the um, prison data set on Mars in the Millie Fosse, which Elena also talked about, and we found um, that uh, there was quite likely that talc carbonate could 
explain a lot of the carbonate features that we actually see in milling phosphate. Um, and so that's, uh, that's the broad uh, outline of the, the link between um, the silver and Mars that we have. But, um, but then this has been followed up by uh, a couple of papers from Christina Viviano, who Elena uh, mentioned, and, and also um, this paper by uh, McSweet. And it um, uh, was, uh, was making the point that uh, it's very uh, difficult to form talc in shallow areas of Mars. Um, and particularly uh, due to the low pressure situation there in, uh, in the Martian crust um, and the local level gradient uh, that, uh, that we're likely that we uh, see on, on Mars, what we infer in the Martian regolith, that it's really difficult to form these subsidization reactions. He, uh, he calculated this uh, map on the right of, uh, of our activity here, the CO2 versus temperature and um, formation of. Uh, talc is the um, PC areas here. And up, up in this gray area here is the sedentization region of um, formation. A couple of other people have shown me type of um, uh, plot, so I won't go into it in a lot of detail. But basically, uh, the point of our project was we wanted to work out whether we could get talc forming at lower pressures. Um, so I reran um, uh, uh, HAPS. Uh, uh, calculations. He ran them at a kilobar, and it's 0.1 kilobar. And again, to cut a long story short, we found that we're actually getting lower temperature formation of the um, sedimentation uh, materials, i.e., talc and so on. Um, it was moving further to the right in this reaction. Uh, so that's um, that's that's good. That's um, that's good as far as um, computer models are concerned. Let's skip those that that uh, that slide there. Um, but then, um, just to talk about the uh, the possible. Uh, Sorry, Adrian, we're we're just about. Our, we want to make sure we can have our other speakers talk. Yeah. Okay. I'll just talk about the the, the scenarios that I'm looking at now for the top carbonate hypothesis, and potentially um, this could have been you know, the carbonates that we see in early fossa could have been formed by a commodiate lava flow that was buried and then later exhumed. And we see here a stratigraphy of the area. Um, and I just want to highlight that, um, that our latest uh, work is now concentrating on, um, this will be reported at LPSD, on uh, the Jezero Crater region where we're looking at the carbonates uh, that are forming there. Uh, this is work that I'm doing with uh, Christina and uh, Tim Gouge. We're actually looking at the Jezero Crater Delta and how we can access the top carbonate bearing rocks uh, that might be nearby. This is one of our map products that we're uh, working on here. We can see Jezero Crater in here, and uh, in green we see carbonate uh, uh, carbonate bearing regions around the crater, including this, this very interesting layer that's uh, near the delta, but not lying on top of the delta. Uh, and and the, the key point we is that... Up in the left, okay. Up in the left-hand side is this talc bearing area up here, and that's in the watershed for the crater. We, we're interested in pointing out what lies in between uh, the crater and that, that talc carbonate bearing area up in the top left. Thanks. That's great. Will you thanks present your that face. at LP, it, Yeah, thanks a lot. Will you present yes, that at Abscon as well? No, I won't be at Abscon this year. Okay. Well, hopefully. All right, well, thanks yeah. very much. Thank uh, next is uh, Julie Castillo. Hey, hi. Welcome to my slide. So, uh, I'm going to go through because, um, as expected, Mark did a very, I mean, an excellent review of the state of the field in the area of what we have learned from Donat Pires and how it compares against prediction. So, going to the second slide, I just want to re-emphasize the point that um, can you hear me okay? Don revealed that surface surface is covered uh, by hydrate as hydrated mineral, um, ammoniatic clay, serpentine, and carbonate, and this in a quasi uniform manner, and um, which is very important. But locally, 
there are bright spots of um, carbonate, especially sodium carbonate and ammonium salts, uh, as Mark said. And this, comp you know, this composition uh, compares very well with what has been found at Antidadis. And also on Earth, we have in uh, uh, volcanic lakes, we find similar compositions like uh, the lake surf in California. Another important result from the Dawn mission is a measurement of the amount of iron on the surface, uh, which is slightly slow that it's um, usually measured on PI and PM chondrites, can suggest that there has been some differentiation, physical differentiation um, of serious material. And so both both types of observations, mineralogy and elemental, suggest that CRS was uh, subject to extensive global hydrothermal circulation. And here is this plot again from Young Air 2003 that shows that in a body that is relatively large beyond a few hundred kilometers, uh, you can have multi-pass flow, um, if, especially if early on you had uh, a global melting event driven by aluminum 26 pK. And in smaller bodies, you have only a single pass flow or even a stagnant uh, liquid in direct. So, Mark already touched on that. Now, I will go quickly just to point out that looking at just at the surface mineralogy, we can infer constraints on the conditions of serious early ocean. The ammoniated clays are really a strong diagnostic. Of, of these conditions, uh, they require some relatively high partial pressure of hydrogen, um, which, to, which tells us that the material that we find on the surface is formed at depth and were excavated by some global mechanism that we are trying to um, identify. And um, the ammonium exchanges, ammonium mm. exchanges, exchanges with uh, cation, which leads to the production of salts. And as Mark noted, the temperatures in the early oceans were likely relatively on the colder side. I said mild, but it's really close to uh, 10 or 20 degrees Celsius. And then the carbonate, the fact that we have these two types of carbonate, uh, magnesium, calcium, and uh, I could use the PI, uh, the VRO maybe, that will help. You have magnesium and dolomite on the surface. You have so, uh, bicarbonate in solution that end up forming the bright spot. Um, sodium bi uh, carbonate or bicarbonate. Uh, all these help us constrain further the um, redox pH. Two minutes, Julie. Was Sorry? Two minutes, yeah, I'm almost done. So as was noted earlier, okay. there, there should be a lot of methane in solution that then form. Uh, class traits. Uh, just to point out, and maybe this lot a lot of information, it shows the volume fraction of uh, solid material formed as a consequence of aqueous alterations for various assumptions on the water to work ratio and the, the amount of certain volatiles in solution, ammonia and CO2. And what you see is that for 5% of weight percent of ammonia and 2 weight percent of CO2, Accreted early on, you can reproduce the composition uh, detected by the um, uh, Don. The, uh, yeah, the composition of the surface measured by the Don mission, and especially you, you can match the ratio of, of serpentine to clays and um, and carbonates. Huh? If you do the opposite, you have more. You form with more CO2 and less ammonia. You find something that is very efficient where you cannot form as much serpentine, you form a lot, the iron, you form a lot of carbonate and the iron uh, goes preferentially with the carbonate. And uh, what we find in the end is a feature that is very different from what Don observed. And that is important because we can, we think we can put a constraint on the early uh, comp the composition of the aggressive volatile on stress. And just to finish, um, I would like to the last slide. Uh, a summary, so we know by now that there is this phase is again for extensive access alteration. Um, and that is going to be important because um, there is leaching of potassium, especially from the rock. We need to, re to revisit the models of these objects entirely in order to, um, to account for the displacement of the heat source. 
uh, the fact that there are a lot of brands in solution also suggests that there should be uh, still liquid water. In Cirrhosis today, you'll see at LPSC and at Psycon that we have found uh, the presence of liquid at depth, extensive liquid at depth, and that, that is a fascinating result. And okay, I we'll look forward to say, seeing that. Yeah, yeah, it's really exciting. And, and then I just want to encourage more, you know, interaction between the uh, IC Moon community uh, and CRS. There is a lot of uh, of things to learn from both communities. Uh, and CRS is close to us. It offers the playground for testing hypothesis developed for Ocean World. Thank you. Great, thanks very much. Um, so we'll. Uh, Penny Morel. Hi, Penny. Hi, can you hear me? I can hear you really well, yeah. Okay, perfect. May I start? Please go for it. Okay, um, first of all, I just want to say thank you to Jen Blank who told me about this workshop and who suggested, highly encouraged that, uh, that I give a pop-up talk. I was inspired to give one uh, based on Tuesday's results um, where microbiologists presented data both from uh, the tablelands and the cedars. Uh, and these are both ophiolites in North America, you can see from my map. And I thought I would give a biogeochemist's perspective of these two sites. Uh, first of all, they're both ophiolites. They both have ultramafics that are being altered by groundwater. They both have springs, uh, ultra-basic ultra -basic comp ultra -basic compositions, so high pHs, uh, pH 11s and 12s. Uh, the cedars, let me see if I can use my pointer here. Uh, did that work? Maybe not. Okay, the cedars has pH, um, uh, again, 11 or 12. So it has uh, it bubbles with uh, hydrogen and methane. While the tablelands were dealing with the lower concentration of uh, dissolved concentrations of methane and hydrogen. We heard from Billy Brazelton and Matt Schrank um, about how both these sites are similar. They've got uh, beta proteobacteria. They've got hydrogen aphaga. Uh, uh, Shino uh, Suzuki published about the... Um, Serpentomonas at both sites. Uh, and so on, on the surface, you may think these sites are very similar, but the take home message from my pop up talk is that they're actually um, quite different from a biogeochemistry perspective, specifically in the type of carbon that the microbes can use and, and the products that are produced. Um, so why don't we start with methane? Because we all like look, look at methane. How do I change the slide? Uh, so you just want to click the right arrow icon that's in the bottom left of, of your slides there. Ta da! There you go. <laughs> Excellent. So one classic way of uh, sourcing methane is to look at the carbon and hydrogen isotope values of those methane uh, of the methane. And so I've got um, uh, on the left-hand plot a CD plot, hydrogen isotopes of methane versus carbon isotopes of methane. And on the right-hand side, I've got a Bernard plot, which just looks at the ratio of methane to ethane, propane, butane, divided by or plotted against the carbon isotope values of methane. The blue fuzzy areas represent vaguely a field for Microbial methane, the orange represents a vague field for uh, thermogenic, and I don't have abiogenic plotted on these, but um, a great review by Sherwood Lawler, by Atope and Sherwood Lawler in 2013, puts the methane on the CD plot on the right hand side, overlapping both the thermogenic and the uh, microbial. Let's look at uh, the methane at these sites. Uh, the tablelands uh, plots in an area not microbial, we call it non microbial uh, methane. Um, while the table, well, the cedars plots in uh, some of the springs methane plot in a very microbial area, while we also have other springs that suggest that we have mixing between a microbial and a non-microbial source. Isotopes are just uh, an indirect indicator uh, of the source of methane, so we wanted to look at something a little more direct. And so we wanted to see if we could make microbial methane in the laboratory using materials from both of these sites. And so we take water and, um, and sediments from the bottom of uh, the pools where these springs come up. And we did experiments where we fed uh, different micro, but different substrates like bicarbonate, formate, and acetate. We have, um, uh, and, and then we, we look for, for the products that are being formed. And so at the table end, we saw no difference between our live controls and our killed controls, which is basically uh, confirmed that we weren't able to make microbial methane in the lab. Um, but the cedars was a different story. We found elevated concentrations of uh, methane in the live versus the killed controls. And in the C13 labeled experiments, 
we saw methane that was enriched in C13, which was an indicator that we were getting microbial methane from or within all the um, uh, all the incubations that we that we that we studied. I'm wondering what happens if I do this. Oh, oh, there we go. Okay, um, so this just shows in our killed controls uh, the methane had the exact same isotope value. Um, and in our con um, our isotope controls, so this is non-isotopically labeled experiments, we had depleted uh, C13 values. And then there we go. Oh, that less than um, and then or a penny. Sorry. Okay, perfect. So we're seeing enriched methane. Great at the cedars, but not the tablelands. Um, on Tuesday, we were also talking about acetogenesis. So I want to see, show you that we did find microbial VOA, um, so volatile organic acid production in the live versus the, the killed. And then as I zoom through this speedy talk, uh, um, Everett Schock also talked about the possibility of microbial utilization of carbon monoxide. And so we did those experiments as well, both of the tablelands and the cedars. And the data here is shown from the tablelands where we did get carbon monoxide utilization, but we did not get it at the cedars. So the take home uh, point from my talk is just that these sites are extremely um, different biogeochemically, and these are just looking at ophiolites. Um, uh, we have, we're not even talking about the spentonization in the ocean or spentonization happening in ultramasic in, say, like Percambian rocks. Um, so and all of these sites have, have potential to have biogenic signatures, abiogenic signatures, and we should be using these sites to look for the preservation of those signatures. That's it. Thanks. All right. Well, thanks so much. Um, I'm going to take the last minute to send it back to uh, Tori and Tom. Great. Uh, thank you, Steve. Thanks to all of our speakers for the day. Um, I thought that we should wrap up the workshop just by revisiting uh, the perspective that Alexis supplied at the very beginning, which is uh, why did we do this in the first place? And really, um, this workshop comes about as a result of, of recognizing that we've had something like a decade now or so worth of, of interest and work done in, in an astrobiological context on serpentinizing systems. And so um, as we step back and take a look at that work, and in particular, a lot of the exciting new results, um, you know, the, have we changed our perspective on serpentinizing systems as, as a, a target of astrobiology in particular? Are there things that we've learned uh, that help inform us better uh, about the habitability of these systems. And for me, one uh, exciting aspect of this is a lot of what we heard here considers serpentinization as a process. And I think that's really important as we um, evolve our perspective of habitability, not as a not as a snapshot of current conditions, but as a as an evolution of conditions uh, through time. And so I think it's really valuable to uh, consider habit consider serpentinization as a process uh, applied to habitability. And the other thing is we wanted to, to integrate perspectives. So we purposely constructed this workshop in a way that, that included uh, or hopefully spanned from biological to planetary perspectives. And one thing I at least was very struck by in the talks today um, is in part uh, how, how how much the planetary sciences folks are obligated to do with relatively limited data but also how much they're able to do with that limited data. And so I think there's a remarkable level of inference and constraint that can be drawn from, from what are often sort of uh, you know, distant uh, data sets of, of imagery or spectroscopy. Um, can we extend that inference all the way down into the biological? So can we take the sorts of data that we're seeing from, from spacecraft as we explore the solar system um, and begin to integrate biological and, and geochemical perspectives as well to come up with a sort of holistic picture. So um, these are things that, that we hope to sort of capture. I think these are things that, that the NASA Astrobiology Institute is, is interested in understanding as a, as a statement of community uh, perception um, at this point in time. And so we encourage you to, if, if, if you have any insights that have resulted from the last couple of days of, of workshop, um, please help supply them. And, and in the beginning, we suggested that any such insights could be emailed to Jen. Maybe Jen will supply her, uh, her email address again so that um, this can be an ongoing process in, in which we consider uh, continue to, to sort of uh, uh, pull in your perspectives. Um, so and, and also just in bringing this to a close, there are a number of people to thank in all of this. First, uh, I really would like to thank all of you for participating. So. Um, I know we had people tuned in from around the world. Um, uh, 
Uh, we bounced, I think, between sort of 50, 60 to sometimes as many as 100 participants. I think that was awesome. And what I really was um, gratified by is the, the level of interaction amongst people. I, I thought it was just really fantastic the extent to which people chimed in and participated uh, in this process and made it a dialogue, not just a monologue. So um, thank you all very much for that participation. Um, Thanks very much to NAI, uh, to Estelle, and to Mike, and to, uh, to Sam. Um, from my perspective, this really felt seamless, and I think it's remarkable that we had 100 people distributed at their own individual computers around the world, and yet it felt like many of you were here in the room. And, um, you know, that didn't just happen. That's a result of, of the... the um, <laughs> the really excellent management of this event by the NAI folks. So thanks to all of you. Thanks, um, I feel like it was a really, really well done thing. Um, uh, thank you very much to all of our speakers, to both our invited speakers and to our pop-up speakers. So to the invited speakers, um, you all were chosen because you represented the set of perspectives that we hope to capture in order to give a well-rounded perspective. Uh, and I don't think that this would have come off as well uh, had you not been willing to do that. And really, thank you also to the pop-up speakers. Um, you know, we, we sort of uh, put that out there in the hopes that people would contribute. And I was so glad that, that we got such a high level of, of interest and participation and people willing to contribute perspectives in what was a, a very um, uh, limited uh, ability to actually give a talk. I mean, to give you five minutes and ask you to say something <laughs> comprehensible is, is kind of a big challenge. But I think you all delivered. So, so thank you very much. Um, Thank you to Billy and to Tom and to Steve. Um, each of you guys did a fantastic job, not only in organizing your days, but also in, in managing them very well. So effectively, we asked each of those three people to, to, um, to organize and run a one-day workshop, uh, and I think that was very well done. Um, uh, thanks to Jen. Um, this was very much a, a collaborative endeavor in organizing this workshop. Um, Many, many times where uh, where two heads were better than one in, in addressing some of the things that we came up with. And so I really appreciate that. And finally, um, thank you to Alexis. Uh, this this really was um, Alexis's brainchild, I think, to, to see the need for this workshop um, and to also uh, sort of consistently apply uh, motivation and enthusiasm in, in seeing this come to fruition. So as she mentioned, um, this really came about sort of as a result of, of something that happened at the last EBSICON, and, and we're about a year and a half away from that. So it's been a while uh, for this to come together, but I, I'm, I'm glad that it finally has, and I think that it, it really came together in a way that we all appreciate. So, um, so thanks, Alexis, for that. Um, and I think that's it. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Oh, that's right. Uh, Jen, Jen reminds me to just mention that uh, all of this has been captured. So the, the talks and the commentary and everything will all be online and, and you can find that through the NAI website. So anything that you wanted to add, Jen? No, just thank you to everybody. Mm -hmm.